I call the meeting. Um, order. This is a workshop of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the Town of Salisbury. It's not a public hearing. So I will say we have received three pieces of correspondence. They are not going to be read into the record. They are available up here in the front for those who want them. Um, Firstly, I'd like to introduce the commission to you. I'm Michael Clemens. I'm the chair of the commission. The extreme end there is Andrea Salvador, alternate. Kathy Shire, commissioner. Uh, recording secretary, Georgia Petrie. Marty Whalen, the secretary. John Higgins, vice chair. Nancy Bruzy, zoning enforcement officer. And staff to the PNZ. Alan Cockerline, Commissioner Vanella uh, Schiffer, alternate. Our goal tonight is to learn from you. We have heard over from various ways, from various people, newspaper articles, concerns about what we're calling short term rentals. So we have decided to hold a workshop to understand from you, the citizens of Salisbury, your feelings about this particular trend. There is indeed a growing trend in short-term rentals. We'd like to hear from you about the potential benefits and risks to the community. We want to hear from the residents. It's a vehicle to understand your views regarding this practice. And as such, we'd like and welcome an orderly audience participation. I also would like to state at the outcome that not all aspects of short-term rental fall within the purview of the PNZ. And it's very important for all of you to understand that we have no preconceived position on this matter Rather, our goal is to proactively, responsibly gather facts from the residents and then actually determine whether additional actions are required. There is an outline of what we're doing that's also available here. I'm going to try to stick with the outline. I'm also going to try to keep this workshop to hopefully less than three hours. Um, because I think everyone will be fatigued if we go much past 9.30. So we're going to start off, first thing I'd like to acknowledge two members of the commission that have done a lot of the legwork on this. Dr. Schiffer and uh, Ms. Shire have really done so much work uh, getting the word out, thinking about this, making connections, and I do thank them for that. We're going to start off with an overview from Jocelyn Ayer. She's the Community and Economic Development Director of the Northwest Council Hills Council of Governments. She's going to give us a short-term overview, uh, rather a short overview of short-term rentals from a regional perspective. Jocelyn. Thank you. Um, yes, I will, I will be quick. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm going to try to do this so I don't have to have my back to very many people. Um, but I am the, um, I work for the Regional Council of Governments, so we are the uh, region's land use planning agency. Um, and we work for 21 towns. Our board of directors are the chief elected officials, the first selectmen and mayors of our 21 towns. It's basically the region that you would think of as Litchfield County, but not exactly the county lines. Um, and I also happen to be a resident of Salisbury. Um, but tonight I'm here with my <coughs> regional planning hat on. Many of our towns are um, dealing with this issue, trying to figure out um, how to address short-term rentals and Airbnb um, and their impacts. Um, so a lot of communities ask, you know, what, how do you define a short-term rental? Um, and basically, it's either a room in a house 
or a whole house that is rented for less than um, 30, 30 days. Um, that's, how we, that's how it's typically defined. A regulation can define it differently, but in my research, um, that, is, that is generally how it's defined. Um, the number of short-term rentals and the frequent, frequency with which they are rented has really increased a lot in our region and all over the, the country, really, because of platforms like Airbnb and other platforms that are really making it very easy to, to list your place, for example, um, as a short-term rental. And for as a person who might rent or want to go somewhere for the weekend, for you to find something. Um, so because of these platforms, this has really become something that um, is happening more and more often, especially here in the northwest corner of Connecticut, and that's why I think it's risen to the level of something that communities are thinking about the impact of. Um, so the benefits of short-term rental, um, we talk about a lot um, uh, in terms of, uh, for example, promoting tourism. We know that there are a limited number of places to stay in our region, and obviously having uh, short-term rentals available increases the number of places where people can come and stay, experience what we have to offer. Maybe even they come here for a weekend and then they decide to become, um, you know, to, to try to find a house here year-round. Um, so, you know, there's obviously um, impacts on that and when they're here they obviously they go to our restaurants they support our local businesses so there is that impact of short-term rentals uh, for some people it also defrays the cost if they have a, a second home here or if they um, rent a room in their house obviously this is a way of, of having income um, defraying the cost of home ownership um, in our towns which have very you know fairly high um, costs of, of uh, owning a home. Um, and it can generate revenue for the community in terms of taxes, obviously. Um, so those are some of, the, some of the benefits. And then in terms of the challenges for short-term rentals, um, you know, they do impact neighborhoods. Um, and um, there have been uh, reports, obviously, in towns of increased noise from, um, you know, if somebody's just there for the weekend, they maybe don't know that there are neighbors home or they, you know, are having a party or whatever. So there's, um, there can be increased noise, there can be increased traffic if there's not, say, a cap on the number of people um, staying in the home. Um, so, um, and some of the Airbnbs um, <coughs> in the region are managed by people that are far away. They're not, in, they're not you know, in the town at the time that it's rented or in the house. Um, and so, um, you know, sometimes that leads to a situation where there's something going on and no one's around to kind of supervise it or, um, you know, deal with neighbors' concerns. Um, it can, we, I, we have heard from local inns um, and established bed and breakfast uh, that they have a, at least a, a feeling that they are competing with, with bed and breakfast. You know, they have regulations um, that they have to follow, uh, that an Airbnb owner doesn't have to. Um, and so um, many local inns have expressed a feeling of unfair competition. Um, so that's just something else that is kind of out there. And, um, you know, um, the other, one of the other challenges um, is that it can reduce the number of um, housing units in a town that are available to folks who want to rent year-round. Um, so as you probably know, in Northwest Connecticut, there's not, very, not, not a very high percentage of our units are rental units at all. Um, so when you reduce that by using some of them for just short-term rentals, it just means that there's less availability for people who want to rent all year. Um, so that's an impact that has happened in some of our towns. Um, and um, there can be safety issues for short-term renters if, for example, uh, a person who is renting on Airbnb hasn't thought about things like 
um, you know, making sure the smoke detectors are working or making sure that the people who are there just for the weekend know all the means of egress and, um, you know, making sure they understand that you're on a septic system and you can't do this or that. Um, so there are issues like that that can come up with the shorter term um, uh, rental uh, rentals. Um, so in terms of, of regulatory approaches, um, uh, basically um, towns are addressing this issue with either um, zoning regulations or a town ordinance. Um, and we can get into some of the, uh, just, a, I'll just a little bit of the details of what some of those can say, but um, basically they're, you know, like Michael and like the Planning and Zoning Commission here, the COG is also not saying that um, we don't have a stand on this. Um, we feel like every community should have a meeting like this one and talk with stakeholders about what the impacts have been <coughs> are, are or are not in your town, whether this rises to the level of something that the town needs to regulate. Um, but there are lots of different ways it can be um, regulated if it rises to that level. Um, there's, and again, there's no one size fits all approach to that. Um, so what's happening here tonight is a great um, way to start you know, talking about the issue. Um, so some examples, um, if, for example, so those are, these are objectives over on the side, like if, for example, the town is concerned about the availability of year-round rental housing, one thing that a, regula a regulation can do is, um, for example, allow only permanent residents to <clears throat> rent their um, houses or allow only rooms in occupied houses to be rented short-term. Um, there are towns that limit the absolute number of short-term rentals in the town, so they um, can permit it and say, you know, any, in any given year, we're only going to do, uh, give 50 permits, for example. Um, and so they, you know that it's never gonna be more than 50 places at once, for example, that would be uh, short-term rentals. Um, you can also set a cap on the number of nights per year. Um, there um, are also regulations that limit the number of people on the property at a time. Um, there are some properties that, <clears throat> in other towns that have been that have been doing, you know, they they rent it overnight and it's got like three bedrooms, but then they end up having a big party there, um, and so you know having. And again, that, that leads to potential noise impacts or traffic impacts. So having a, a, a limit of a number of people per property <coughs> is something that regulations can address. Um, uh, in terms of quality of life issues, obviously <coughs> a regulation could deal with, again, making sure there's adequate parking and garbage disposal, just like any other place, but again, making sure that the um, the landlord in the situation is taking care of those things. Um, you can require hosts to post in the noise ordinance. So again, short-term rentals are, are aware of what hours they're allowed to be outside screaming or whatever. Um, <clears throat> requiring a local contact person is something that many towns do. Even if the owner of the property is far away, if they have somebody here in the, you know, within a 30 minute drive who can respond when needed if a neighbor has a question or a concern. Um, that's something that the regulations can address. And then safety issues, you know, if you decide to regulate these and you have some kind of permit application, you know, you can obviously make a safety checklist. If you're gonna rent your unit, you're gonna make sure it has carbon monoxide detector or so, uh, something that tells people how to, you know, where all the means of egress are and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, so those are, there's many different um, regulatory approaches um, that are available to a town when thinking about this. Um, we do, you know, in my research on this, I, it does seem like <clears throat> zoning regulations are uh, clumsy, often a clumsy way of trying to approach it because 
zoning regulations usually address the use of the land. So is it residential, is it commercial, um, for example, and not the length of stay of someone. Um, so um, in our, in my research, it seems like um, an ordinance, you know, if the town decides it wants to regulate it, then addressing some of these things in an ordinance approach um, could be a way to go. Um, so um, uh, I was asked to talk just briefly about what some of the other towns in the region are doing to address this. As I mentioned, many, many of our towns are talking about it. Um, and um, uh, so the towns that are considering an ordinance approach, <coughs> sorry, rather than a zoning regulation approach are Roxbury and Winchester. Winchester is kind of in the middle of the conversation. I don't know if you guys have seen the articles. There's been an article or two in the newspaper about it. They are really trying to think, figure out whether they want to go the route of an ordinance for zoning regulation. Um, and uh, <coughs> some of the towns, for example, Norfolk, um, Barkhamstead, and Kent, they're basically regulating their Airbnbs the same way, or thinking about them the same way as regular bed and breakfasts. So really what that means is if is um, technically you need to live on the property and you can you know you can rent a room or whatever, but um, otherwise you're kind of not in compliance. Whether they're enforcing that or not is another issue, but that's I think how they're addressing it is through their regular bed and breakfast um, regulation. They have addressed it or they're contemplating addressing it? They feel that for them, for right now, their bed and breakfast, their standard bed and breakfast regulation in their zoning regs is working for them, and they're not. That's tantamount to potentially banning some kinds of behavior. It is, I think. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then um, Cornwall and Litchfield are, you know, another two towns in the region that have been really talking about this and thinking about it and just haven't decided how to approach it. Um, you know, obviously, if you're going to do a new regulation, um, that comes with enforcement. You know, that you'd have to do enforcement. And um, so that has been some of the concerns of the towns that have thought about it to date um, is what, do they have the capacity to, to enforce a new uh, regulation on this? So, so that's what's happening around the region. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you, Jocelyn. Do any members of the PNZ have any questions on Jocelyn's presentation? <clears throat> I have one question. I mean, have anyone, has any of the towns explored regulating via, via special exception, special permit? Well, um, I haven't. Um, I, I think that warrant the, the, the draft the warrant regulation that they're drafting there actually the town is in the middle of a lawsuit with an owner of an Airbnb property <coughs> and so they're waiting to see how that goes um, before they do their regulation but I believe that that what they have drafted would be by special permit or special exception go ahead Justin also is there anywhere a definition of Airbnb. I think part of the problem is they're referred to as bed and breakfast, but none of the rentals are bed and breakfast traditional, the way at least zone. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to refer to it as just another, it's just another, it's a platform for short-term rentals. So the definition in my mind is anything, anytime a place is renting for less than, the term of the lease is less than 30 days. It's a short-term rental, and Airbnb is just one of that of those. Yeah, because one of the things that we have experienced as we've been researching this, that you know, people tend to put these in the classification of bed and breakfast. Right. So then we, you know, they are regulated, blah blah blah, but nobody really thinks of their property as a short-term rental. Right. Because they think of it as a bed and breakfast when it's really well, and, you know, there's a there's a very different impact, um, and it's a very different thing if you if you are renting a whole house and you're nowhere around it 
than if right. you're renting a if you're renting a room on Airbnb or not on Airbnb, um, and then it really is more like a traditional B and B. Um, so, yeah, the thing about Air about the platform Airbnb <laughs> is that it can be any of these. There's a spectrum of different right. units available, and they have different <laughs> impacts. Right. You know. Is it isn't mm -hmm. Airbnb more of a middleman? Aren't they more of a sure. they tend to be yeah. they don't they tend to be a kind of corporate uh, middle person and initially Airbnb was a real problem to individual bed and breakfast owners because they paid no taxes. Right. And it wasn't until Roberta Willis passed legislation that made them pay taxes in Connecticut that they, because it, it was basically unfair to individual bed and breakfast owners. Right, they, they were sure. good, it was Excuse good me. for consumers. You, you but would not actually for us own. It would be helpful if people identified themselves for the record. We're trying to have a record. Yes, sorry. Uh, my name is Richard Boyle. I'm a co owner of a bed and breakfast, the Earl Grey Bed and Breakfast, with my wife. And we've been doing that for 25 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Was someone else had a question? Yeah. So another man. Uh, Dan, oh, uh, my name is Joseph Koch. Uh, I'm at 15 Lapland Meadow Road. Um, w when you were talking earlier about the regulations that have been, I don't know, limits on the <coughs> people, safety things, stuff like that. Uh, but when you review the discussions locally that were taking place in various communities, have any of those regulations been pondered upon? I mean, I know they've generically been pondered throughout the country. Right. But are any of those, uh, any of the local communities addressing it in that sort of fashion? None of the towns in our region, a lot of them have been talking about it for a while. Um, nobody's actually adopted a regulation, either like zoning haven't. regulation or town ordinance. So all of the kind of things I was talking about is, again, in my research kind of nationwide, um, how, have, how, have, how, how, is, how have these issues been addressed through regulation? Um, the seats right up here in the front, please come mm -hmm. Sir. Hi, my name is Jared Kedar, um, I'm 12 Harry Street. I have a part-time Airbnb rental, I guess. Um, the thing with the Airbnb platform is that it encompasses all those types of rentals also because people who have, air, have traditional bed and breakfasts use it. People who have, don't have traditional bed and breakfasts but rent rooms in their places where they live also use it. So it could be considered covering all those kinds of areas. Um, I think the underlying question is what does the town, what is the town seeking, seeing as the issue? Well, that's exactly why we're having this workshop, and maybe that's a great segue to get into the first set of questions. I have an outline, they're available up here in the front, and I'd like to read the first three questions. Question number two, we've had the introduction, uh, we see? Yeah. Well, we may need to share some. Okay. Those are letters that we received. Okay. You all get what you need, we'll continue. Okay, I'm, I'm going to speak while you're here. The first set of questions are the impact on Salisbury real estate. So the sub-questions that we're looking for input are how do short-term rentals compare to permanent inns, bed and breakfast, and traditional rentals largely brokered to real estate agencies or privately? And what is the impact on housing stock? Some of the things we've heard 
are buyers specifically purchasing homes <coughs> primarily to create short-term rentals. Other things we've heard is that the traditional <coughs> rental market is being affected by this. So these are the first set of questions I would like to get input on. How are they comparing with the permitted ins? And I think we heard some of that from Jocelyn. But what are the impacts, basically, to the traditional rentals at the RE that are brokered through real estate agencies? And I see we have several, at least several, real estate agents here in the audience. We <coughs> see at least three of them. And are people really purchasing houses specifically to create? short-term rentals, or is that a, one of those rural myths? And I see Pat first, followed by Robin, followed by Ju Julia. Julia, I'm sorry. Hi, Juliet. Juliet. Julia, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Pat Best, I'm a real estate agent. I also have rented out my house short-term. It was not something I intended to do, but I was approached because I live close to Lion Rock Farm, and they're always desperate at the wedding weekends. And in that case, they're not competing with the inns or the bed and breakfast. They can't get rooms. You know, so it is fulfilling a need in that case. And it's, it tends to be a very high-end tenant. I've, I've had, I, I do it on a very limited basis, uh, the whole house. And it's been a wonderful experience for me personally. As far as the way it affects the real estate market, I think I've experienced all of those things that you mentioned. Number one, two of the people that rented my house started looking at houses to buy because they liked it here so much. Now, I can't say that's a trend, how many of those, you know, I happen to know two that came to my house and then wanted to look at houses. Two um, houses. To buy. To buy, to buy not necessarily to buy to make here be a visa. No, to buy, to, buy. to use. They just loved the area. Um, I also, personally, a lot of the Hotch, a lot of my uh, the people that have approached me are Hotch, Hotchkiss parents or Indian Mountain parents, and they some of them would have taken an academic year rental, but then they figure out for the number of weekends they're going to come, if this option is open to them and they can get a very nice place, this makes more sense for them. So is that hurting our academic year rentals? I, I, I really am I'm not sure, you know. That's a tough question, but there are, it's another option for people. Uh, as far as, I, I do think that it, it hurts the long-term availability of rentals in general, but so do the academic year rentals and the summer rentals compared to, you know, people, people who want a 12-month rental. It's tough around here because you can furnish it and rent it either for Airbnb or you can rent it for the summer and then the academic year and make a lot more money than if you rent to a 12-month renter. But Pat, that's always been a problem. That's right? always that's, been a problem. That's not the you. No, that's not an impact of Airbnb, I don't think. Thank you. Robin. I would agree with some of what Pat Best has said. I'm Robin Leach, also in real estate here. I do not do, I have a big rental market per se. My opinion of Airbnbs is the main effect on inns is that the prices are a lot lower than the inns are trying to get for their rooms. And it doesn't matter whether it's on a week or day or nightly basis. Um, I hear from people with whom I talk about it when they're looking to spend a night or two nights here that the inns are charging more than they would like to pay and therefore they are looking at Airbnbs because they are generally less expensive. I don't think they affect the seasonal rental market as such. I think that's been affected by the change in the economics of life <clears throat> more than anything else. And people do not, no longer seem to want long-term rentals because if they're not going to use the property, <coughs> why pay for it during the term that they're not going to use it? So Airbnb or short-term rentals uh, substitute very nicely for that situation because they only are used when the people really want to come up here and visit. I don't think they're affecting sales and I don't see people trying to buy property to, 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 for rentals because rentals in my opinion have not been really that strong and there are any number of rentals that are going unrented right now 
probably because the prices that are being asked by the owners are outside what the potential tenants would like to pay. And that has nothing to do with Airbnbs being present or not present in our town, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Robin. Juliet. Uh, Juliet Moore. Um, I'm a real estate broker, and I'm a former in or hotel owner. There are way too few hotel rooms in the area for the really busy times. Ooh for uh, parents' weekends, uh, uh, graduations, weddings going on. We took, many guests got, found them places in Great Barrington, Poughkeepsie, everywhere we could. We took them home on parents' weekends because they had no place to stay. I think it's <coughs> the most positive thing that can be done in this area that used to have a lot more B&Bs than my mother used to come here in the 30s for vacations. Um, but, so I think that there's a real need for this. On the other, on the um, real estate broker side, we don't want to handle weekend. No, we don't. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> you could get every single realtor in the area here and <laughs> I think all say that. Yeah. It's extremely cumbersome doing the leases, getting the security deposits, putting things in escrow, getting them checked in, getting the houses clean, all of that. We, we can't do it for a weekend rental. And there are all these protections with the Airbnb website, with insurance and security deposits all set up. And um, my son does it for his apartment. He travels to them all over the place. and. I don't know, my sister did it for years in her home and she never once after years had that experience. I'm sure there can be an exception, but there could be an exception in a hotel or a b and And I think that they're terrific for the area. They bring people here, people fall in love with the area, and they do buy houses. And they spend money. And they yes. spend money. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Okay. Yes. I'm going to go right. There's three ladies with hands up. I'll start. We'll go around. Yes. Uh, my name is Christine Jennings. I'm also a real estate agent, and I live at 38 Bunker Hill. And I also Airbnb the downstairs uh, bedroom suite of my house, um, mostly parents' weekends, sometimes wedding weekends. It's been very successful. Sometimes my neighbors find out, and they don't even come through the website. Uh, never had a problem, and they have their own entrance, and they come and they go. Um, I would say also that I agree with Juliet, um, Pat, and Alvin had said, definitely I think it's a needed um, commodity in our neighborhood. I also know of at least three uh, houses that were purchased just for Airbnb by families who have kids at boarding school. They bought the house, they obviously use it a few times a year, but they Airbnb, and it was so successful the first time, they did it the second time. And I also know a fair amount of faculty who live on campus at these various boarding schools, and they look around for um, houses that they can rent out. Not always Airbnb, sometimes short-term rentals, sometimes academic, sometimes annual. And then once their term on their campuses have finished, then they might move into this house. So just another... Um, you know, scenario. But I, I, I do know that there are people that look for these cute little houses in town that they can turn around and, and rent. Sometimes it's Airbnb, sometimes it's a different type of short-term rental or academic. Hello, my name is Kelly Clark. Um, we live over on Valley Road in Lakeville. And we also have a rental unit for Airbnb in our basement. There's a couple of protections on Airbnb that you can select as a manager or owner uh, to prevent some of the negative situations that the speaker, I'm sorry I came in late, so I don't know her name, was mentioning, such as parties. You can actually click no parties allowed. You can also, and obviously if you have two beds that are queen beds, you're not gonna rent to six people. But I mean, those sorts of things could be regulated um, to some degree. But I don't see, I know three other Airbnb people, I don't see anybody doing that. 
we don't want our homes ruined. We just are trying to make a little more income, and there's no way I would rent my basement year-round because I don't want people in the house all the time. <laughs> so it's a very part-time situation for when it's convenient for you to have people there. Uh, the second thing is, I actually had two couples this month, one from Hong Kong for Hotchkiss, and a second one from Singapore for um, Indian Mountain School, both of whom are now going to look for houses to live here. Not to rent out, they, these are successful people who have no intention of managing a property for that sort of thing. So I think there's a little bit of everything in the situation. Um, another thing I, I heard mentioned in the presentation was something about you know fire codes and whatnot. Um, I know on Airbnb about five months ago they added a thing so you check off that you have these things that you have um, COD um, alarms that you have um, fire safety measures exit. in hand. Exit. Um, and I can say I've never been to a hotel where they showed me where the exits were. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, certainly, um, we I have them come in one door, I walk them through everything, and then they have their own uh, egress and entry after that um, in the downstairs unit. So, uh, And there's a fire extinguisher. So there's certain things you can check off on that site that allow you to have these safety measures intact. Uh, and I don't think any of my no neighbors even know we do this. <laughs> it's not a infringement um, on our, at least not where we live on Valley Road, so. Uh, and the people that have come, I'll agree with some of the other uh, folks that they've been excellent um, people who we have, many, in many cases, become friends with. Uh, they're either race car drivers going to Mine Rock, their parents from some of the boarding schools, um, or there are people coming for leaf season. Someone actually came from Spain last weekend for leaf peeping, and of course it didn't happen yet, but uh, that's the whole reason they came. <laughs> so um, I think there's a little bit of everything in there. And the other people that I know that are doing it, I've yet to have had a bad experience, so it's been very positive all around. Garrett? I'm Garrett Richardson, and I have, we have a house, my husband and I have a house on 31 Robin Hill Lane and a little one in the village. Um, we, we did Airbnb and VRBO for a couple of years, and we had a very positive experience with it. We had a family stay for the bulk of the summer, um, and then we had a whole series of individuals coming through for the schools, for Lime Rock, for weddings. Um, we didn't have any bad experiences. Maybe one person was sort of rough on the linens, and that was about it. Uh, we had, we also had a rental that's an um, affordable housing rental that my husband has operated for years and years. And we didn't have any conflict between our long-term affordable housing rental people and the place we were using for the Airbnb. Uh, and that went on for about a year. And then we had more trouble with the long-term affordable housing rentals than we did with the Airbnb. Yes. And from our perspective, it's something that we could do. This is a really rough area to survive if you're not wealthy. <laughs> and, you know, um, it was something that worked, that we could do. And the, the websites manage a lot of things. They do it really well. Uh, I've also done it as a traveler uh, in other states, and it really... It, it seems like a good idea to me. Um. Yeah. Hi, I'm Terry Dunn. I have the Meadow House at Lime Rock, right by the track. But what I wanted to add to what these ladies were saying, on Airbnb, it's not like other websites where they can just click and book your room. You can't do that. They have to ask permission to book your room. You get reviews on them. You see where else have they stayed. What did other people say about them? And they also see that about you. And then you decide whether you're going to accept the reservation or not. You already know who they are. They already have a history with the company before they even come to you and you with them. And of course, there's insurance is involved. You're covered for insurance. Your neighbors are covered for insurance. And well, the most important thing is that you get to review and see who you're picking. Something like uh, booking.com, they allow instant booking. You don't know who's coming. They can say it's two and show up at six. But Airbnb, they can't get away with doing that because you're going to nail them immediately. They're going to be thrown out, they're going to lose their deposit, and your insurance is going to pick it up. 
So the good part about Airbnb is you know who you are renting to, and you decide whether you want to or not. And you've got, what, three days or something to make a decision? So you can really investigate the person's history before they come in to your neighborhood. Let me have kind of a question. Yes. So basically, you have a bed and breakfast, which you have a special permit for from the town, correct? No. You don't? No. I'm in the process. OK. So you're doing both no. bed and breakfast and Airbnb? I only do the Airbnb, which is like a bed and breakfast. When I can, I usually rent to people from the track. So I take track people and they stay one or two nights and, and leave. I don't do any long term at all. So you're not a bed and breakfast? Well, no, I guess no, I'm not. I mean, I, mean, I, bed, I was confused. Okay. A, bed and breakfast, <coughs> a bed and breakfast is kind of just a random term. It because is a random term. No, well, I, I mean, I know there's a town, so there's a town. We have a very distinct no, regulation of what a bed and breakfast is. What is a bed and breakfast then? Go to our regulations and look at it. Very clearly. Read it to us. No. Yeah, we don't know what it is. You got it. Let's hear it. One second, you want to hear it? Yeah, okay. here it is. That someone else wants to? Yes. Hi, I'm Madeline Joyce. I'm off the Meadow Road. I do a very limited um, Airbnb. Um, in addition to what the lady over there was just speaking about, um, I don't do home away VRBO because they do not require a government ID. I'm very particular about who I allow to come into our house. It's our house, we're there, you know, much of the time. And, um, I can only say that sometimes I get back from a weekend, it's mostly the Hotchkiss, it's mostly people either looking for a house, Hotchkiss, or maybe a birthday present, kids from the city coming up, uh, mostly in their you know, 30s, 40s, many families. The house is often as clean as when I left it. Sometimes I even think they've actually cleaned the house for me. I walk in, I'll call Joe, I'm like, you don't have to believe this, this place is cleaner than when I left it. So I have not, you know, not would have had any negative experiences, but they, I will not rent to somebody that does not have a government ID on file. Because if you're not going to go to the trouble of putting that on file with Airbnb, I don't, I, I don't even want to talk to you. And I refuse people all the time. So I'm, I'm extremely careful. Thank you. Okay. Here is from the code. Michael, if I could just. No, I'm going to read the code. Oh, okay. That's what I was saying. Okay. 210.4 bed and breakfast. <coughs> a bed and breakfast used for transient visitors located in an owner occupied dwelling shall meet the following requirements A. <coughs> suitable structure. The structure shall be suitable to accommodate guest rooms based upon its interior arrangement, size, and structural condition. Complete bathrooms shall be provided at the rate of one per two guest rooms. B, maximum rooms. No more than three guest rooms rated for double occupancy shall be permitted. Bed and breakfast use shall also be eligible for an accessory apartment use, provided the bed and breakfast shall have a maximum of two guest rooms. C, additions. Minor additions not to exceed 200 square feet may be made to a structure for improvements necessary for bed and breakfast use. D, length of stay. The owner, op the owner operator shall maintain a guest registration book, noting length of stay. Food service shall be limited to service overnight guests. That is the Salisbury Zoning Code as it pertains to bed and breakfasts which are obtained via a process called a special permit or special exception. To get a special permit, you file, there's a public hearing, interested parties such as your neighbors have a chance to weigh in, and then the special permit is either granted, denied, or granted with conditions. That's what the special permit process is. Michael, I've just got a question on that. Fire marshal has to approve as the part of the special permit? Does it? Well, it's part of the standard criteria of all special permits. Yeah. Yeah. 
Who enforces it? And how many are there listed in the top one now? Ben Brown. Legal. This is off the cuff, about 10. Or special, less. 10 or less okay. that are formally applied and are considered bed and breakfast under our standard. I think at the moment, Michael, it's possibly six or even five because I got the list from the assessor and Dan Allen and I split it up in terms of contacting people. I think we only had about five, didn't we, Dan mm -hmm. And we have at least one gentleman, maybe he's not here anymore. He just left. He left, who was owner of one of those. So when I think a, an important distinction uh, to, to remember, to keep in mind, is that a bed and breakfast, the owner has to be on premise when the guests are visiting. In a short-term rental, the owner could be, is most often not present. The uh, renters are there by themselves. So let's go, yes. Yeah, um, two things. One is that... Identify yourself, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Mary O'Neill, Interlaken Estates. Um, to do these short-term rentals on a regular basis is extremely labor-intensive. To respond and to have the place cleaned and to make sure everything's okay. So it's not like you blithely throw up your property onto the website and walk away. Um, the other thing is it might be helpful to instead of looking the, at the quantity of properties, is to look at how much they're actually rented out. Because you can put your property up and it can go for weeks on end without anyone staying in it. And I think it might be a more realistic picture of what's going on with this to look at the actual nights that a property is occupied versus the sheer magnitude of properties, because not all of them rent and some of them rent on a very limited basis. So I just put that up there for another metric to determine you know, the impact on the area. That's actually a very valuable comment because I heard when our assessor began sending tax bills to Airbnb owners that several people closed down their Airbnb because they were not getting enough revenue to justify the tax bill. Which There's no is, way for the town or anyone to see how many nights somebody's rented that. Yeah. They have they? to be on their account. Right. You have to show your Airbnb account. Right, right but no, right. where to get that data from? Sorry? Where would one get that yeah. data from? Well, I, I, mean, I don't know how you I can get it, it to you. But, it's, I don't, I don't, I, but my point is that not, I mean, you'd have to go on right. to each property and right. see the nights. But I think what's the, the point I'm trying to make is that just because there are properties listed doesn't mean that they rent at all or on a regular basis. So I just put that out there. Someone who hasn't spoken yet, please. Right. Well, my concern is yeah. as a home, my name is Elizabeth. I live at 13 Perry Street. Hello, Martin. <laughs> and uh, as Mr. Bedar has his Airbnb directly across from my home. And because he is absent and lives in the city, he can't see what goes on a lot of the time and there have been I would say maybe 70 percent of the time very disruptive visitors at his home. People arrive at two in the morning. It's a very narrow street. It's not a vacation street. It's not on the lake. It's a residential street where people are working and need to get up early in the morning. We've had people come at two in the morning, unpack their cars, they're talking as if there's no one else around or no one can hear them. Our evenings have often been very disruptive. And in terms of the Lime Rock people who come and stay, we've had people with glass packs on their cars. We've had three Bugattis this past. They make your trucks and cars extremely loud. Yes, yes. Not fun. Yes, you've gotten my memo, but mm -hmm. it's a concern. I mean, it really impacts our life. People come there, they think they're on vacation, mm -hmm. and, and they are, but they'll sit in the front yard till 2, 3 in the morning, laughing, drinking, smoking their cigars, disrupting our evening, our night's sleep. The last group we had, lovely people, and very nice people, elderly people who came from England or something, and they had Bugattis, three Bugatti cars, 
antiques with no mufflers. They stayed a week. I cannot tell you how loud that was. In the, in the end, they would tinker with the cars in the driveway. They would be racing up and down, not racing, but up and down the street constantly. It was, it, it was just, it rattled the house. I mean, we've had so many bad experiences with visitors at Mr. Kadar's house. People, uh, you know, he allows, I'm sure it's the legal number of people, but maybe six or eight cars all parked in this very limited area on the lawn, on the street. There have been many times we couldn't get out of our driveway because the cars were blocking our driveway. People have backed into our plantings. Uh, but mostly it's the noise and the disruption. And again, it's a very small street. I can understand if you're in a rural area, if you live on the lake, and that, that's a vacation area. But on our street, it just seems like an inappropriate facility to have on our street. With an absentee landlord who doesn't know all this. And one evening, 1 o'clock in the morning, 12 kids compiling out of the house. One of the uh, uh, alarms in the house went off because, uh, uh, I, I don't know if it was a CO2 monitor or something, needed batteries. We had the police, we had the fire department, we had kids all in an uproar on the front lawn, right outside of our bedroom window. I mean, this seems like an unnecessary uh, hindrance in our view. Did you complain to the homeowner and to right Airbnb? Here. <laughs> I did. He complains to me. A couple of times, I called him at one in the morning. I, I just had it, and I said, you know, I hope you're getting a good night's sleep because everybody here is suffering. And and that was the night that the CO2 detector went off. Well, no, yes, we definitely been asked. I wanted to ask you, have you been able to contact Airbnb? No, I, I think this is a town well, issue. Well, you can't. It's, well, I mean, I just asked that because it's a firewall. Airbnb communicates very well between the clients, but if you're outside, there's no way to get in. That's that's an issue. So you're saying that that I should contact Airbnb? Well, have you ever thought of it? No, I call the, I call Jerry. Wait one, one at a time. If there have only been two times that I've called Jerry, I've actually been so angry about it because maybe not so much this summer, but for the most part, it has been a very active house. People will stay as, as few as two nights, as long as a week. And, and then people are in and out constantly. We've had some really questionable characters staying at the house. People all studied, I mean, nobody, I feel like he's bringing transients into our neighborhood who don't belong there. There were even some men who were staying there who were calling out to little girls walking down the street got off of their phone, uh, we were watching this, to call out to little girls who had just gotten off their school bus. Now, does he know this? No, but, but this is somebody introduced to our neighborhood, perhaps threatening the children on our, I mean, it was just beyond creepy. Uh, may, I, may I address some of these oh. comments? So that's? That's my experience as the neighbor of an Airbnb homeowner, and it's not been positive at all. What is the what is the zone in Perry Street? What is it? R R ten? R twenty. R twenty. It's still yeah. residential. Well, I'm just curious if you know that how many of the B and Bs are actually in. I'm sorry, not Airbnb. STD short term rent. STD. <laughs> are actually in R20 or R10 district. I mean, because that, nobody knows. That, that could be a, that could be a zoning issue. No, that could yeah, that, be a limitation that, that makes sense. Correct, that's yeah, right. I have, right. I have no neighbors that can hear. Correct, and that's sort of, yeah. we're here to look for solutions. If, well, first we're here to determine if there really is a, pervasive problem. Then we're here to look for solutions, if they are, that fall within our zoning purview. And one of them might be the underlying zoning yeah. that may render certain portions of the community not suitable for such activities. I'd also like to suggest if you're going to create categories, one that, that's a good one, I think. 
But I also think there's a difference between someone renting out their primary residence two weeks a year, which the IRS doesn't even ask you to report the income. Uh, you know, what's the difference between that and somebody who rents for the month of August? Why should uh, you know, they not be allowed to rent for two weeks? You know? Well, Pat, you actually, this is one of the fundamental questions I have. There's been a long tradition in this community of renting, of, of rentals. And I've been grappling with this personally. I mean, the rights of people to use their property unfettered by governmental regulation versus the kind of problems you've just heard about a neighbor who is being denied the ability for the quiet enjoyment of our property. These are the kind of things we can look at. And I heard about issues that are within our purview, part of the number of parking, that falls within zoning. The whole issue of competition, fair or unfair, is not, we're not here to regulate uh, private enterprise. So if the Airbnbs or short-term rentals are creating a more active market, so be it. That, that's what this country's about. I mean, it's about people's choices and about being able to provide a variety of consumer choices. When we get to what we just heard, we now get to some of the nuts and bolts that affect really that are within our purview. And these are the kind of things that we need to understand. But we also need to understand, frankly, and I'll be very direct here, we've heard from one resident, how pervasive are these problems throughout the town? That's one of the things I'm hoping to hear from people. If this is an isolated incident, on a very congested street with possibly one particular property, or do we have more of these, and where are they located? And I have someone who hasn't spoken yet, and then you will. Yes, sir. I'm Carter Ferguson. I live on Interlake Road, between the road and the lake, uh, and next door to a uh, <coughs> vacant house that has been used for Airbnb. The owner lives on the other side of the continent. Uh, I have submitted a paper. I have listed in it some of the difficulties we've had as neighbors of wild frat parties that have gone on for weekends with 20 and 30 people crammed into this little cottage. Uh, people abusing our property, not knowing where the boundaries were, but more troublesome probably, abusing the lake, throwing beer bottles, broken glass into the lake, trash and garbage. Uh, we've had, our daughters and grandchildren have had the fish broken beer glass out of the lake. The uh, parties go on all night into the wee hours of the morning. Uh, there is no supervision. And it seems to me that the, uh, one of the key aspects of this problem is supervision. Uh, people who share rooms in their house with uh, transients in the traditional way described in our regulations <laughs> is fine. Uh, they are there to supervise what goes on. I think our regulations, when they were drawn, were drawn very wisely, limiting the number of people who can be guests to a number which is manageable by the owner who is present, requiring a registry of those guests. So if any of them commit crimes or get into trouble or molest, little children or do something else, there's a record of who they are that can be found. Uh, there, there is present, most importantly, I think, and it's in the regulations, uh, an owner who occupies the property and can serve as host and as supervisor and in terms of public safety can get access to the, and knows about the town resources, police, uh, the emergency uh, vehicles and so forth. Uh, uh, 
People have drowned in our lake. Some of them have been drunk at the time, and some have been visitors who are just unaware of what we are or what our community is like. And I think it's terribly important that whatever you decide in terms of uh, transients coming in and staying in our homes, that they be in the homes which are occupied by the owner or some adult who's responsible for what goes on. I also think it's terribly important to limit the number of people there. Now, believe me, they are not all Hotchkiss masters or parents. Uh, a lot of these places rent to the largest number they can cram in. Uh, it's unfortunate that this, that our realtors really have abandoned this area, except to sort of stand on the sidelines and encourage uh, property owners to make more money on the property. Uh, because I, I think that in the old days where realtors had some role in finding and brokering arrangements between uh, longer term tenants and owners, they had some sense of whom they were matching up with whom. At the moment, while Airbnb itself as a result of a number of lawsuits has begun to publish some additional requirements. Some of these other outfits, uh, booking.com and so forth, have no such requirements. Now, uh, you mentioned those of us who live near these public nuisances and hazards, that we should be calling Airbnb and taking it on our shoulders to try to police something that really involves our zoning regulations. I don't think that's the right way to go out. It seems to me we made a very good step sending out tax notices uh, for some of the marginal places. Uh, I think we can make another very good step if we make it clear that the only exception for owner-occupied residences use of uh, transient rental income is described in the regulation which you read in 210, Article 210. That's the only place it is. There's no other exception in the regulations for this kind of promiscuous renting of vacant property to unknown uh, mobs of, of young kids. And that really is not good for this area. People are going to die uh, if we don't try to regulate the way in which we host guests to our area here. Uh, we, there, this is not a one-off problem. This is a pervasive and growing problem. Uh, we know about it on the lake. Uh, I'm sure other people know about it in other parts of town. But uh, you, you would really be shirking your duty if you don't come up with some way to control the extent to which people are taking empty properties where they don't live and in residential zones and turning them over to uh, an unknown group of uh, people who are not acquainted with the area and are not supervised. Yes, you are next. I think I have a, a couple of solutions for both of these problems. One, that if you're not on board living in the house with these people, Airbnb has an option which the person who owns the house has to hire a manager, and the manager, a local manager. And the manager is on the website, their picture, their name, a little bit about them, and that person has to meet the people. It doesn't matter if they show up at 2 in the morning. Secondly of all, I would, I would be very upset if I heard race cars going up and down my street also, and maybe they need to just be in the trailer and not be allowed to be driving up and down the street if they're at a facility. I did have one man park in our pool driveway with the trailer, but he didn't drive his car around or work on it in the yard. So maybe those things have to be restricted to Lime Rock itself. Um, and then thirdly, you can't you say have, restricted to Lime Rock? Well, you know, they can work on their cars over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and not at your house in your driveway. Because Lime Rock's a village, too. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I meant the track. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, and so if you have a manager, um, which again, I know people outside the area who do that, that person is like the homeowner in the sense that they meet the people. Certainly, I did have one case where someone brought an extra person, but they explained that it had like just happened because that person's wedding arrangement stay fell through and whatever, and they paid extra. But point being, people shouldn't be sleeping on mattresses all over a house. There shouldn't be 12 and 16 people staying in a house. There should be, if you have a bedroom with a queen bed, then there's two people you're allowed to have. If you have a queen bed and a twin bed, you're allowed to have three people. I mean, it, it can be simply regulated based on that. And, and also making sure that someone has a manager that is accepting these people when they come in. Um, and that would cut down on having people sneak extra people in. Uh, and the, the third thing is, is, I mean, you can easily say no parties. You can say that. You can yeah, say you can have people stay, and they can do, go about their business, but you can't have a wedding in the backyard. I mean, there's ways to, and that's also on the website of Airbnb. So it can be required that you check off no parties, and that someone has to manage the property. But you know, we're talking about short-term rentals in general. Airbnb is one platform, yeah. they're the most sophisticated platform, and we're really well, talking... Well, you can do it for the other two. You can say, if you live in town and you are renting your property for short-term, you have to have a manager. That manager has to be available 24 hours a day to respond to whatever the situation is and to meet the people as they check in and go over the regulations of the town. You know, you can't drive your race car up and down the street. You know, we also have on Airbnb, and you can say it for the other sites as well, for town purposes, that there's no noise between 12 p.m. and 8 a.m., period. I mean, you can play music or something in your room, but you can't be, you know, making food loud and disturbing people outside. So there are easy ways to address that. Juliet. I think there's a limit to what we can regulate. I can come home at 2 a.m. My neighbor can't turn me in. I mean, a home, what a homeowner can do. Oh, yeah. Um, and people race up and down Wells Hill Road all the time that have nothing to do with rentals where I live. But I want to just correct the gentleman. I, we did, the realtors have not abandoned rentals. I've handled 24 this year so far myself, and it's just October. Um, we work very hard at rentals. They are difficult, but we work very hard at them. Um, doing weekend rentals, almost prohibitive. But I want to just give you an example of one family. They came here in a house exchange. They lived on the Cape. And they did a house exchange with a family that lived here, and they fell in love with this family. <coughs> They bought a, came, bought a house through me, and every winter they go to the Midwest to visit their family, and I rent out their house. And then often in August, they want to just pop out for a little time in the summer, and I rent out their house, sometimes for the month of August, sometimes for three weeks. So is that going to change the way? I just want you to understand that how much you want to regulate, you know, things these are people, you know? I, I find them tenants. Never in five years have we had a bad experience, actually fabulous experiences. Somebody who rented, two parties that have rented for the winters have bought houses here. Um, somebody is renting who works for Jasper John this winter, this winter because she doesn't want to have to travel as far as her house is for the, for it, during the rough weather. You know, this is a very positive experience for this family. How much are you going to regulate them if they want to rent for three weeks in the summer instead of four weeks? It just, the, I think the, the bad experiences are very, very minimal. And I think that they're terrible. But I think the neighbor needs to report it to the owner. The owner needs to blacklist them on Airbnb so they can't rent again on it. There's a process. One curiosity I have is the bad experiences that have been described. I mean, I don't know at what point something fades into kicking in conventional nuisance types of regulations. I mean, I assume, you know, that you can't blast music at 2 o'clock in the morning as loud as you want anywhere, disregarding short-term rentals or not. So I don't, 
exactly understand when 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 do you call the cops and tell them look these guys have got to got to shut it down. I mean, in New York, when you live there, you can do that. And it works. <laughs> um, I mean, it, both of the negative experiences describe things that strike me as being sort of conventional nuisance type things that somehow should be addressed through conventional enforcement. All right. Um, I'm going to move along. I'm Kevin Wiscotti. Partners at the Interlake and Inn. We have 90 rooms over there. Um, I don't think you can control any guest, any time. <laughs> 35 years. You, you can do your best, and I think I share a lot of the sentiment that Carr and Carr and I have had coffee over the summer. Um, there's been there's been a few guests that have been um, taking liberties, and I think that the town really can can put their foot down and say, hey, look. If it's an Airbnb, it becomes almost a commercial application. WPCA, you say call the cops. Well, the resident trooper is paid for by the businesses and the residents of this town. So if, if we have to start calling the cops, then, then the Airbnb is also taxing our community. This is, um, it's, it's very simple. I, I love Airbnb. I, I stay at a lot of Airbnbs when we travel around the country. I recommend a lot of the Airbnbs because our property, I can tell you, there's 46 states in this year that are completely sold out. And Bugatti, I could have sold 80 more rooms from Bugatti. But, so I'm very happy that I was still able to take a banquet for 150 people because we had Airbnbs to support Bugatti. But they should not be doing what they're doing. They don't do it at my property, so why are they doing it at any other property? It's, it's so disruptive to our lives. Okay. We've soon have actually already covered item number three on the outline, which is the benefits of STRs. We've covered the supplemental income for homeowners. We've covered the fact that they're cheaper than average vacation rentals. And there's a home atmosphere. So let's go to number four. We've heard about that too. We've heard about that. Wow, some of it. We haven't heard about all of it. So, the basically safety preventers and neighbors, fire code compliance, ingress and egress for first responders, increased traffic, and adequate off street parking. We've heard one area where there's a problem. Is there any other areas where there have been problems in that area? The parking. Yeah. I, I just want to comment on both cars and this lady's problems. Both were apparently, Robin Leach again, both areas were apparently not owner occupied, the situations. Parking on the street, if it was on the side of Perry Street, short of putting no parking signs up, it would seem all guests should be able to park on the properties that they are spending the nights on with their cars not clogging the driveways and not clogging the streets these are these are what you guys can do in the zoning regulations to prevent the two negative situations we've heard here tonight if the owners are there or a manager who is essentially maybe he should be living in the place also so that he, the owners or the managers aren't bothered by the noise of the guests that might stop the negative situations but this gentleman here is in New York, apparently, so his, he doesn't know who's there. And there were three Bugattis and seven people. There should be no more than one person per bed or two, a double bed situation, allowed in the houses beyond the use permitted for bed and breakfast. So three or four simple things could solve the two negative situations, which I've heard in this room tonight. Owner-occupied. Owner-occupied or a man who lives on the place, so he's not disturbed by the guests as well. So that becomes a bed and breakfast then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it becomes a bed and breakfast. Maybe that's what it has to be. And um, It's not rocket science. It needs to be done ahead of the problems, like Lion Rock Farm had with the Sharon situation with weddings that have music going on at 12 o'clock at night and the music went across the valley and bothered a lot of people on Belgo Road or, or whatever it was. 
and Sharon permitted this to get going, but they didn't have any ordinances in place. So what you're suggesting is the solution to this is to require that these are owner-occupied. They're not. Well, that seems to be the easiest in initial solution to the problems that I've heard. Both problems have been non-owner-occupied properties. I haven't heard anybody else who said all the good things have happened. I fully agree. Have not been there. No, well, mine is not owner-occupied. I leave when you it's not. Possible. But <laughs> when you're charging a lot of money, you get a different type of tenant. Sorry. I meet every guest. I will not let somebody in my home unless I Oh, have I meet them, guests. but I don't stay. I don't stay there. They, 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 they don't want me there. They want their family feeling. Get out of the city for the weekend. Or parents coming in from, like, this weekend from Seattle. They don't. It would not, it would not work. But you meet them. I meet them. And, you and I absolutely meet them. I, I screen them. Oh, absolutely. Well, not been really good. <laughs> back to your operating. So, I've had no yeah. other complaints. Excuse me, sir. So, in fact, you're operating as an Airbnb manager right. would operate. Have a last day on South Vermont with friends. I also have my friend. This is the number. Call this person. I, I really want them to have the most wonderful experience they could possibly have. I have a five-star rating. And I, you know, would like to be able to continue doing this as we have been doing it. I work very hard at this. Joe can tell you, I'm not working full time right now. I work full time cleaning the house and fixing the house, <laughs> buying this, and buying that, and not paying for it. I mean, it's gotten obsessive for me. <laughs> right. We've heard about quality of life for neighbors. We've heard about noise, trash and the concept of increased quasi-commercial activity within a residential zone. And there's also the question of environmental sewer, septic overloads, lake and wetland contamination. So, I've heard, what do you feel the solution should be? We've heard, what, I know what car you would like the solution to be, but the rest of the community, what would you like the solution to be, of anything? Yes. Lisa Keller, Flying Rock Road. Um, <coughs> my biggest concern would be safety of the home to make sure that whatever home is being listed, and maybe the only way to do this is through some town regulation, that there are enough fire extinguishers. I mean, logic would tell you you would need this, but. People are going to get away with stuff if they don't have, if it's not regulated, but fire extinguishers, smoke detectors, that sort of thing. Um, possibly if a neighbor's house is within so many feet of your home, you've got to get their permission, or is this somehow there's got to be some understanding amongst neighbors. But I think it's a great way for people to make a little extra income in this area. Like this gal over here was saying, it's a hard place to earn a living. So if you're owner occupied, you make a little extra money. I think that's great, but uh, obviously not at the expense of your neighbors. Right, right. The taxpayers. So safety was my biggest concern. Make safety. Sure that, yeah. And safety. That could be dealt with by some sort of permit. I would think so. And yeah. I don't know if I agree with taxing people that are trying. We are not. We are not part of that. Okay. Actually, I went on record. Objecting and objecting to that because I think on one hand we are sitting here assessing people taxes on the Airbnb and other similar platforms, and now we're talking about regulating them. It's very difficult when you've started to tax someone on something that sort of gives them some sense of expectation. So I don't agree with the, what the assessor has done in the town, to be blunt. And I went on record. And so did the Plain Z's legal counsel advising against it. But we can't control the assessor. Even the first selectman can't control the assessor. You left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's really tiny. <laughs> it's, it's a statutory thing. There are limits, there are limits to what, how much we can influence the assessor. Yeah, she is petite. <laughs> I have two car. Michael, on the question of what to do about it, uh, I do think that having the owner present, occupied is, is the word that appears in the regulations, is a very good idea, or a representative. 
but in terms of going forward, the special licensing procedure has worked perfectly. We can't think of all the possibilities, either for granting a license or not granting a license. Every situation is different. And I think if the short-term rental, less than a month, has become a fairly common uh, um, borderline, if people want to rent for less than a month, they should apply for a special license and their particular situation, the location within a residential uh, zone should be considered, the condition of the house, what the applicant is going to do in terms of supervision are all questions that can be decided case by case with the current special licensing procedure. Special permit. Special permit, sorry. Right, which has a public yes. hearing, which allows neighbors to comment, which can condition the, uh, the approval. There are conditions then placed on each, let's say, let's say we went that route, and I'm not advocating it. They'd have to apply for a special permit, there would be a public hearing, and a special permit usually are granted, but with very specific conditions and limitations. Right. And that may be one way if we choose to do it, that we could do it to zoning. What do you think of that, Jocelyn? From a, from a, because I know you favor the ordinance approach more than the zoning approach. Um, yes, I mean, again, as you know, it's all about what's in the details of your regulation. Um, so it's hard to, without seeing what, you know, what your, again, what, uh, what the regulation actually says, it's, it's hard, it's hard. I, I, again, from you our- You don't have a regulation for this, I'm saying, you have to write a regulation right. for a special permit for a short-term rental, which would have, which would have some of the things in the bed and breakfast, but obviously would have some differences too. Well, you could have a template, you could have a template and then the conditions could be for example, number of occupants, number of vehicles, Correct. where they would park. Right. And, and, so, and some of the other towns, I mean, I have, I have some examples in my folder of towns that are regulating it through a special permit process. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I think that that is definitely a way, a way to go. The only reason I like the ordinance approach, um, again, <coughs> in my research, is that um, you know, A, uh, you can, again, the, the thing about the duration is just a little bit of a strange thing for a regulation to deal with, um, but, um, you know, other towns are doing it and getting it by their legal counsel, so it must be, it must be legal. Um, and then the other pieces that you could establish, for example, uh, um, you know, many towns have talked to me about concerns about enforcing the regulation because it does add an additional burden, you know, you have to be out there, you have to see who's renting on Airbnb or other platforms and, um, you know, you've got to be fair about your enforcement and, um, you know, that does, that can add an additional enforcement burden and so an ordinance would allow you to say, um, you know, charge a $50 permit fee or whatever, it, it would allow you to charge a fee that then could go towards the enforcement um, of the regulation, which is my understanding why some other places have decided to do, to go in ordinance for One of my fundamental yeah. concerns about zoning, zoning regulates the use, use. not the user. Right. And, and I kind of feel like we're on this cusp of moving beyond zoning here. Right. And we're not regulating the use as much as the user. And I think, I'm not sure, I would have to check with our legal counsel whether or not, I mean, to me that, I'm not a lawyer, but to me, it seems to be a slippery slope, personally. The, the town of Stonington's legal counsel came to that conclusion. But other towns, legal counsels have, um, a pair, other towns have adopted a regulation for short-term rentals and I assume it went through their legal counsel. So as you know, lawyers can disagree on Correct. <laughs> do you know of any do you know of any cases that have been brought challenging those those and what the uh, what disposition of those are? 
I do not. I mean, I know there have been a lot of lawsuits around short-term rentals, but I don't know if it was about whether zoning regulations can regulate the user versus the use or the duration versus the use. I, I, I haven't heard about that. Do you know if it were against the town regulating bodies or towards the property owners, those lawsuits? The ones that I'm thinking about when I say that? <laughs> um, those were, um, the one I'm thinking about specifically is the town of Warren Planning Zoning Commission being sued basically for what they felt was enforcing their existing regulation, but the applicant disagrees. It's an, it was a, it's an interpretation. Of I mean, because one of the things that we've talked about is trying to get ahead of the curve on that. So that, I mean, that was one concern is, is the town at all liable for not having any regulations for the amount and frequency of these short term rentals? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. We don't know the answer to that, but, um, and we've had the discussions many times about ordinance versus regulations. So this information that we're getting tonight is very useful. And the ordinance is that the third order select was present to not support the concept of an ordinance. He's left uh, not to support a concept of an ordinance. So it, it does become fraught with problems. I mean, particularly if we start, I mean, it was a very interesting comment that just because there are a hundred listed on a website, how many are actually being rented? Um, it's a complicated problem, and I'm not sure it can be met through zoning. Um, and there's some bad apples, there's some bad operators here. Clearly, there's a problem on Perry Street. Um, I do wonder whether one way around this might be that these activities are, are not legalized or are banned in the R10 and R20 zone. I don't know how many people would be affected by that, but that certainly is where you have the greatest congestion of, um, of, of density of people and driveways and street parking. Um, well, I, I think you also have to understand that even if there are regulations in place, you could still have these violations. Yeah. So enforcement is, is, a, is a very yeah. concerning issue. It's an issue that the selectmen have for an ordinance. Right. Yeah. Because who's going to enforce the ordinance? Um, it's a question for us with Nancy, you know, I mean, you take some of the examples that we heard tonight, clearly no one's going to call Nancy at 2 o'clock in the morning and expect a result. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so it's going to be, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a process. And, and it could be a permitted, so my point is it yeah. could be a, a permitted use, in which case, you know, it's a complaint. We get a lot of complaints that we investigate thoroughly. Yeah. But you understand my... Totally, yeah. yeah, and I do like the suggestion, and again, I feel like in the towns that have decided to, again, in my research, not in this region, because nobody's done it yet, but outside the region, um, it seems like this issue of having either somebody on-site, an on-site manager, or a person who ha has met the people who are going to stay there and or who is, you know, responsible for um, being called at 2 in the morning if, there's a need, you know, would be something. You'd like there's a job opportunity. Like <laughs> there's a job or two for some There you people. go, job creation. Short term <laughs> rental managers. Mr. Clemens, if I may, I have a very quick comment to make about that. A practical, just a practical comment about that. The person who currently cleans this house across the street is also a neighbor. In all practicality, I'm not going to call this neighbor at two in the morning, ever, and wake her and say, look, there's a little party going on next door, and it bothers me because I'm up all night. In all practicality, that won't work in my situation because I know who the property manager would be. She's, uh, she, you know, she lives just down the road, and. Uh, but if she's tasked with doing that, you see. But it's, it's, it's an enemy me, on that street. This is one of the problems I have, is that more and more, and this is what I call the Fairfield Countyization of here is that more and more people who are unwilling to talk to their neighbors and are willing to react and do that and come to the town and ask them to solve problems that I believe 
can be solved by neighbor talking to neighbor. Well, now, if in fact that woman is the property manager, that's her job to be called at 2 in the morning. I mean, you know, if that's the way we, if that's an appropriate use, I mean, but the town can't, part of the, part of the reason I moved here, many people move here, is people talk to one another, talk to their neighbors. And I've lived downstate, and I work downstate, and everyone, rather than talk to their neighbors, will go and expect the town to solve their problems. Well, it hasn't happened in our situation. We've talked to our neighbor many well, times, and it's made no difference, but, but I think you need to talk to Airbnb about it. I, I don't know. This your situation seems to be particularly egregious from what I'm understanding. Michael, I'm sorry to interrupt. You. Well, well, you I are interrupting. I know that. <laughs> I want, I'm going to leave that for my comments. Do you want to? Play? Why could not the town set up an enforcement situation that if there's a, a valid complaint that's lodged, the owner of the property is shut down for a minimum of a year? And put the owners of proper Under renting. Authority. What? Under whose authority? I don't know. That's, if you I can't mean, do it. We have boundless authority to do whatever we want. Well, there's the owner that's across halfway across the world that's for the problem for Carr Ferguson. There's an owner that's in New York City uh, whose house is rented that's a problem for Perry Street in general. And if the owner can't rent the house, he might, he or she or they might be much more responsible about being more like this woman over here, being personally accountable for who goes in their house before they go in, before the people go in. Robin, you get the badge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I might take the badge. Yes, there's someone up there. I'm going to run this meeting. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. I'm Bill Geiger. I'm from uh, Boston Street. I'm probably one of the original Airbnbers here in, uh, in this area. It's been a fabulous experience. I've never had any of the problems that I'm hearing about tonight. I totally believe that they're happening. Um, but I just don't think a municipality is going to be able to enforce anything that they draw up. I think it's really about pick up the phone and call the police. If you've got a problem with somebody across the street, call the police. Lock them up. Whatever. But I don't think that you're going to come up with any kind of laws that are going to be able to govern this. And you're going to have to somehow integrate it with these websites, like New York City has done. It's going to be a massive undertaking. I, I just think it's about being civil. And if you've got a real problem, call the police. That's it. That's it. Thank you. It's been fabulous. I can tell you for me. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Juliet. That is exactly what I was going to say. First of all, you don't have any idea how many of their 60 square miles. If you're going to regulate all of these, you have it all day, all night, seven day, 365 day a year job. You don't. You don't want that. Very simple. We we'll just raise the real rate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many other complaints you've had, but if you've had two or three or five or ten, it's nothing compared to the amount of rentals that are going on, Airbnb and through realtors. Nothing. It's the drop in the bucket. Hmm. And there is a vehicle for dealing with. You call the owner. If you don't get satisfaction, you call the police. That's what you'd do if your neighbor was being unruly. That's what I would do if my neighbor was being unruly. Call them. Then call the police. But if somebody shows up at 2 in the morning, they're unpacking multiple cars, you don't call the police for that. But a neighbor can just drive in to their home at 2 in the morning. But if they don't. I do. They, they don't. I, but you're quiet when you call it. <coughs> your, your renters are not, Jerry. Uh, uh, my, my, my point is, is that there's many neighbors on the block. The only one who complains to me is Elizabeth. Who lives right I next door? I can, this is right not what right right I can shut that right down. It's <laughs> <laughs> not where we're going. Uh, I'd like to know if some members of the commission would like to ask some of these participants' questions to round out your understanding of the evening. Can I just. Uh, yes, you can do whatever. statement, just so it's full, fully disclosed. Uh, the commission knows, but I'm also a landowner property owner for short-term rental. So I've experienced both sides of the equation personally. We have a, we live on Twin Lakes. We have a small cottage that we rent through Airbnb and the RBO. 
um, and we've had sensational experiences, and we've also had some problems. So I'm very familiar with the problems that we have by doing it correctly, at least I think I'm doing it correctly. <laughs> My, we pay taxes, we pay income taxes, you know, it's all disclosed, etc. But that's why I was saying earlier, you can have all the regulations you want, and you're still going to get a bad apple. If you get a bad apple all the time because the landowner is a bad apple, that's a different issue. Which, but I'm not sure that we would be in favor, or I would be in favor, of getting regulation that's very complicated and, and for the entire town uh, to solve a problem that doesn't exist. But like I said earlier also, we're just trying to get ahead of the curve on this so that we're not chasing a problem and we can prevent future problems from happening has been described. So. I guess my question is, is there a curve? Or are we at, where, are we at stasis? Or do you think it's going to continue to grow? And then the question of continuing to grow, one thing is number of things on the site versus actual number of rooms being rented. I mean, that was a, to right. me one of the most interesting comments to right. that many of these don't get rented a lot. You can get those statistics from Airbnb. And I don't know about VRBO, but Airbnb will give you the number of rentals in Salisbury and Lakeville. Oh, they're they going in 2018, it's how many nights they rented. Through that site, you? Uh, yeah, I went on Airbnb, I said, but. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, not through real rentals. Oh, no, no, no. For, but it will give you on their site, you can call them and say your representative or whatever the issue is and you need these statistics as to how many are available in Lakeville and Salisbury and how many nights are being rented out for the individual houses or just the total number. You can get those figures from them. Can I, can I just ask a question? We have a lot of Airbnb or people here that are doing this. How many of you have properties in the R20 or R10 zone? You're the only one. You're I don't know. What's the amount of land with that house? Oh, you know, that that's a long term. Where do you? It's, no. I've cost it, but that's a long term. It's not a short term. I've no. a long term. No. You're not in the village. No. Michael. I am. I yeah. did not have yeah. those sites, the RBA, the RBO, and Airbnb, and they map them. We can just take a look at them and see what is in the R10 and the R20. Yeah. Mr. Geiger, are you with someone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are in the calendar. Also, from Airbnb, if you're looking at the calendar, it may not be accurate. I, for instance, block off blocks at time because I'm going to be out of town or have people coming in, my own family. It's not accurate. The only way that you can do it is if you can do what she said, reach out to them and see billable days. Because there's a big difference between what's blocked out on the calendars and reality. So. And also, owners can, you can ask owners to give you that information, it's easy for an owner to print out that information because we do it at tax time. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Airbnb does that. That's oh, no, Airbnb would have to do that. But yeah. that's just to me when you talk about congestion, egress, cars parked everywhere, these things are amplified when you're in an R210 or an R20 zone. I mean, that's a very dense. Zone. It's a very different proposition when you're in our zone, our three zone, whatever. That's very different. You got land around you. These problems tend to go away. So the question might be whether or not these things are appropriate within the village, in the villages. Or at a lower density in the village. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm talking about the very intense. Well, what about Maybe only a special permit for the dense areas of town, so that there you can control the parking and the number of people per house, because maybe that's all we have to do. Maybe. Yeah. It's a lot From our perspective, I just worry about if we went the route of special permit. You know, we've had special permits go forever. Mm -hmm. Right. And if we're gonna do 60 special permits, and they're 45 minutes each, well, yes, it will be a lot of work to get special well, permits. That, that's why I'm saying they have to look at the locations. Narrow. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Narrow, narrow yeah. by zone. And the audience should also understand another thing is that this town, 
does not have the ability to find. We can put everything we want on our books and all you get is a cease and desist order or a slap on the wrist because right now the Board of Selectmen have not wanted to actually create fines for violations. So, which is the most powerful deterrent is the pocketbook. We don't have that power in this town. There is one other thing you can do in case of Airbnb. Everybody who lists has to represent that they are in compliance with local regulations. Local regulations for what? We don't have them. We don't have them on any car. That's the problem. B&Bs? I think it just says local ordinances and regulations. But do we have a regulation for that? That's hard to have me. That's the problem. I mean, if you have regulations. So what, you could, what you're saying, I think, Michael, is that you could notify Airbnb that a permitted B&B has fallen out of compliance and get them delisted, but something which we're not trying to regulate at all, <coughs> there's no way to tell you them. If B&B fell out of compliance and we were aware of it, you would issue a cease and desist order, which would not really have any, any teeth because it's not a fine. I'm just saying another thing you can do is prevent advertising on Airbnb by notifying Airbnb that they're not in compliance. I don't know about when you're when you're not a member of Airbnb, that's it's kinda of like trying to talk to someone at Spotify. Maybe we should all be Doesn't maybe, happen. maybe we should become the commission should become an Airbnb. Well I, I actually did I did we, sign up so that I could see their regulations. Yeah. So they list regulations on, or the, they list regulations on their website once you sign up. As someone on the street, you cannot see any of the regulations. And all of the regulations exist in Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York City and Glacier. They're not in Lakeville. So. Yeah. Danella. So let me just share a fact, not an opinion. It's not my view. But the town of Simsbury forbids short-term rentals altogether. And the reason they came to that conclusion was because they perceived the proliferation of short-term rentals in Simsbury as forever changing the complexion of the community and negatively impacting real estate values. So for example, if you live next to uh, a home that's consistently rented out as an Airbnb, does that impact your resale value of your home. So I just throw that out and I'd like to uh, hear if anybody has any reaction to what Sinsbury has done. Well, I agree. I think we heard very clearly tonight from the people in this room that Airbnb has been a very valuable asset. I'm not saying that we have to follow Sinsbury. I'm just saying sure. this is something that has happened. They haven't gone the ordinance route. They haven't gone the uh, regulation route. They've gone the banning route. And Who is, how are they enforcing it? But the reason is because of the what they felt it would do to the complexion of the community as being an Airbnb um, town and what it would do to real estate values. Yeah, another side of that is that the more short-term rentals are made available, the fewer long-term rentals are available. Right now we have a shortage of affordable short-term rentals, so if somebody's got a cute little caretaker's cottage on their property that they might have rented out to you know, a single person five years ago, they're now, I don't know, quadrupling their income by just renting it a few weeks out of the year. So It's their privilege. It is, a, I mean, it is their privilege, but yeah. it is one of the effects. And another one is if, if neighborhoods start to be Become more transient, you lose community. You know, if you can't talk to your neighbor because they're not there because they're transients, where you know where does that lead your neighborhood? So those would be my concerns. I have a short. Well, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think about the concept of limiting, if we chose, these to the more rural areas and not having them? in the village centers. What is, what do you, there, there, do you see any value in that? And I don't think we can, we can I mean, deal I, with I think, 
For the Kadir rental, it is a separate building, and the house is still occupied by the owners. So there is somebody there. It's still in the village, but there, there is supervision. But it's unoccupied. It, it fits in. So I, I don't think you can sort of just. What I'm hearing, it. which was interesting tonight for me, mm -hmm. was the number of these that really are owner occupied or owner managed. And we have a lot of people that are doing this, but they're keeping a very direct. Take the lady there said she wouldn't let someone in her house in without her house, an ID. It's not just and the that. house that she's renting out. I think it makes a big difference. If yeah. It's your house and occasionally. And these two houses referred that are problems are houses where they're absent of tea owners. Right, right. Yes? Yes. I'm Janet Grant and I'm on Lakeview Avenue, so just up the road from Mr. Geiger on Bostwood. So we're both R10, R20, we're both fairly dense. Uh, there seems to me something inherently unfair about within the same town saying some people can and some people can't. Agreed. I think, I mean, I personally think there would be grounds for a lawsuit on that basis. Yes. Yeah. You have to be yeah. very careful about that. Yeah. I have no objection to uh, a permitting process. Uh, I, think, I hope I have the right word for this now. Uh, but again, it needs to be applied across the board to everyone. Why should some people pay $50 to go through a special permitting and other people not when we're both? It's the same use. It just happens to be different conditions, but we all need to be able to fulfill the requirements that you have in this process, through this process. But we have, we have that issue in all, all our zoning regulations. Not everything, and not every use is permitted in all the laws. And it shouldn't be. I mean, take an extreme example of automobile racing permitted in the RE zone, but that doesn't mean it should be allowed in the RR zone, and the R10 zone, and the R20 zone. I mean, that's the whole basis of zoning of that. So the, would the you grandfather folks in? What about, oh, I, I, what I, I, about bed and breakfasts that are in these R10, R20s? You know, existing. What they, about they, the they go through a special yeah. permit process currently because it's in the regulations. I mean, we have to investigate it. I'm just pointing yeah. your, your comment about, you know, what's good in one needs to be good throughout the town. I mean, that's throughout all our zoning regulation. The, the uses are regulated by the area and town in which they're in because well, there's different criteria. The uses allow a user to be used. They're tied to the zones. Yeah. And you do ask a very good question. If you went that route, would existing uses be grandfathered and those would become existing non-conforming uses until they're abandoned? Yeah. Yeah. Do you meet yeah. your guests or do you have somebody available? I mean, no, I don't you... even do it. Ah, ah, so at this it's... point, I, I'm, I'm concerned with <coughs> the possibility. I see. Thank you. And I have, I have done property management in the past. So, I, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm here to see what, the, what, the, you know, what it looks like and wondering whether I need to hurry up and get myself grandfathered in. Grandmother, the fair enough. <laughs> the rush the grandfathering. Mr. Geiger. Thanks. You know, I just want to respond to, I don't, can't see your name, but, you know, in terms of property values, I know of at least three people who stayed at our, uh, our little barn converted to a guest house who bought high-end houses in this area, who I have to believe only increased property values for the area. Um, and in terms of, uh, uh, you know, depleting the housing, uh, affordable housing here, there is no affordable housing. Never has been. Well, not since I've been here for 20 years. The, um, in other words, the little Cape Cod on, uh, you know, my street, Bostwick, you know, you can't rent that for $1,500. It's $2,200. It is, there's nothing affordable. And it has nothing to do with short-term rentals. It has to do with shortage, shortage of housing. Well, that's not true. I mean, I do know of some some small rentals that have shifted to short term because it's more lucrative. So the short term has allowed people to get out of the long term business, and they're oh. making more money. I mean, it's it is their right. I'm just saying, what's the problem? I haven't seen houses going for affordable rents here since I've been here. I don't know. Anyway, so. Problem. I said I'd shut up, but I'm not going to. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
we're getting beyond the problem. I don't think anybody here really wants to stop short-term rentals, no matter what zone it's in. The responsibility for responsible renting is what we're talking about so that the neighbors don't have anything to complain about. And everywhere that an owner has been on, on call or right there, there doesn't seem to have yet been a problem. It's only the non-owner present or non-managed presence of uh, an owner who rents the house out to whoever comes and they, they rent out to Lime Rock, people who come in their Bugattis. He can't help it. He didn't know they had three Bugattis. You can't put the car type on I them. didn't know they had no mufflers. Well, it, okay, but, but <laughs> the point is, if you have one problem, you solve it by saying, you know, you put something on the purse strings to make it so that he will be more responsible or she will be more responsible about the next people who use their house going down the road so that the what, neighbors don't have anything to worry about. What you referring to? What? What person? The owner of the property that has the problem. Whether, and, and so far the owners that are not here are the ones that have the problem because they're not here to complain that they can't sleep. Because they're in New York sleeping or they're on the other side of the country sleeping. <laughs> But everybody around them is trying to sleep. And they happen to have a bad apple renting, which they come in like college kids or race car drivers who, who drink at night after racing and, and sit out on lawn chairs and, and make a ruckus. And maybe have five of their friends who are in another rental house come over and do that. Exactly. So Robin, would, you're, would, you, would you take on, would you want to become a short-term rental property manager? Get the badge. For a good cost, I'd be expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and then, it wouldn't, then they wouldn't rent it because it'd be too expensive. Because you'd have to get my fee back in your rental. <laughs> it's just... A, I know the, we heard the builders, we don't want to touch this, but on the other We hand, don't want to handle... Juliet's absolutely right, and Pat Best was too. I won't do weekly rentals, but that's my choice, not a zoning choice. I won't do daily rentals. See, That's why Airbnb has taken over and everybody's going around. I don't get any rental business from Airbnb people. They don't come to me saying, can you, well, they do come to me saying, can you find something for a week? And I say, I'm sorry, I don't handle it. I don't have the time, as Juliet said. But three weeks or a month, if we have clients who want us to handle their rentals, we will do it. Juliet has told you she does it. I have I done it. But they're not the problem. It's a lot of work. They're not, the pro they're not the problem for the neighborhood. The, own, the people who rent our houses that are real realtor rented usually have reasons that they pick the realtor to handle it instead of themselves. And usually those, those for the most part, are in good, good, aren't they, Julie? No problem. No problem, because we know how to handle who should be allowed in our clients' homes. And I don't allow groups to be in homes or you know, unmarried people who come and party of 10 for a three bedroom house and think they're gonna sleep on mattresses in a, in a big game room or something. Airbnb doesn't solve that problem, or VBR, but there's so many platforms out there. Everybody's been saying how great Airbnb is. It may, I don't use it, I don't do it. But the others, they'll go right around. Jerry doesn't want bad people in his house. I actually screen people very carefully. Yeah, but you don't know anything about cars and mufflers. I don't know. What <laughs> card is on the left Yes, uh, I have a question, Jocelyn. Can I ask you a question? Uh, you, do you have examples of towns that have passed town ordinances, and if they have, what kind of teeth did they put into those ordinances? Yeah, so I have a few examples of town ordinances, not from anywhere in Connecticut, but from other parts of uh, the country. And the, again, I think one of the things about an ordinance is that you can um, put in it, you can establish a fine for if somebody doesn't, you know, if to, basically if you don't, if you don't get a permit like you're supposed to, or if you don't follow the, you know, the regulation, then you can you can charge a fine for not um, for violating the, the so so permit. with the town ordinance there is there is a capacity to fine is, is, exactly I see which we don't have we don't have in this town yeah. yes yes right. 
could say if uh, the police are called three times, you get fined $1,000. Yeah. I mean, make it simple if you could do it. The fine has to have some proportional reasonability. Mm -hmm. You just can't pull it out of the wrap. Yes, and we're going to wrap this up because then I want the commission to discuss some of this. Yeah. I wanted, it does seem to me that ideas are converging in a way that has a certain sort of maybe complexity to it, or at least sophistication to it, which would be appropriate. So I get now that one town, different zones, because we want to apply different uses. So what I'm hearing is, is that the people in the rural areas have a different zone and a different environment, and might therefore be able to rent without being on the premises. And because they're so far apart from one another, they're not impacting community in the way that would happen in this R10, R20 area. There's a lot to be said for paying attention to, you know, we all like to know who our neighbors are, and we don't want people coming and going. We don't want a lot of transients in a dense neighborhood. And in fact, London, Edinburgh, San Francisco, they're all looking at specifically this issue where you cannot have a property, apartment, or house solely for short-term rental if you don't live there yourself in those neighborhoods for those community residents. Uh, so that the, the, the sophistication would come and say, if it's, a, if it's our 10 or 20, it would have to be owner-occupied premises. If it's rural, that, would, that would, requirement would fall away. At least that's what I'm hearing, and based on what I'm knowing about where people actually live and what they're the saying. The enforceability of that is a real it's nightmare. <laughs> All of this is based on enforceability. I mean, there's theory and there's reality. I mean, that has some sensibility to it. I'm actually hearing basically that it's a lack of owner occupancy or owner hands on, whether they're there, Pat Pesco, she hands over the keys, uh, walks people through. The other lady said the same thing. Uh, this gentleman lives by the house <coughs> next door. Uh, seems to be really the absence of any supervision that is the problem on the two two areas the two problems that we've heard is the complete lack of supervision yes. of anyone responsible uh, on site or nearby to remedy to remedy it and that seems to be the take the other take home message I got is that people really like this in this community the realtors aren't threatened by it. They see it as filling an important niche. Um, I just think it's the lack of supervision that is a problem. Mm -hmm. Juliet. I don't have any opinions on this one. Uh, one thing to remember is they're all eating at the restaurants and they're all shopping in the shops and going to the grocery store. So there is a benefit. It's a lot broader. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. I think it might just be a, or just some, a couple of properties heard about which have the commonality is they're not owner, the owners aren't there. And they seem to be the two problems we've heard about. And all the rest seem to be positive. Uh, so it's really a problem of two properties. So far, and a lot of positive. So that's sort of my take home on it. But the two, the two ones that have complained have been quite egregious. Um, and I, that's sort of my take home. I was surprised how many people came here and were so positive about. The ability to do the air, whatever you call Airbnb, uh, collectively experience. I, I agree with you. I, I, I've, I've had that feeling too. I have a quick question for Jocelyn. Have you come across anybody that has tried to distinguish in a regulation or an ordinance 
owner operators or owner leases or completely across that at all? Um, well, sure. I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, a lot of the regulations that are what you might consider a traditional bed and breakfast require owner occupancy. Um, the ordinance, ordinances that I've looked at have required at least, again, some kind of manager who's on call 24 seven, um, you know, a person, somebody who is within a 30 minute drive from the residence that is on call to answer any questions that happen. Um, that, that has been part of ordinances or regulations. You say we could create a regulation with just that one stipulation in it, that Airbnbs are a permitted or, sorry, short-term rentals are permitted in this town as long as there is either owner occupied, owner involvement, or a manager within 30 minutes, or I would say even less. Yes, I mean, is that, is that, I mean again, I'm not an, I'm not an attorney, so I, I, I could, but, yeah, I mean, it seems like that would be a possible um, way to go. Because that would address the two egregious ones we've heard about. Yeah, then the neighbor wouldn't have to clean up the broken beer bottles. Well, and I must say, I don't think it's only Airbnb people that throw mm -hmm. bottles and litter in the town. I think it's very easy to, and I really wanted to ask Carr, but he left. I mean, I think uh, the only beer bottles in the lake coming from the Airbnbs. I, I think it's very easy to, well, to very easy yeah. to, to, to blame all the ills. And oh, that's fair. You've heard the manager of the interlock can say you can't control your guests sometimes. Right, it's you just can't control your guests yeah. sometimes. I agree with that. They could be interlocking bottles in the lake, too. They could work. Well. You should try to do DNA tests on the wall. You know, there is a sort of thing that kind of troubles me, is, is sort of this transient, fear of, 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 you know, it's not welcoming, and we have to be careful about that, too. But I don't think we've heard that too much. I think we've heard the opposite, how beneficial it's been. No, but I mean, there is a sense of, you know, transience. I mean, there was, oh. there was some strong language about okay. transience and undesirables. I mean, transients and undesirables come in all, they just don't necessarily all come out of short-term rentals. I just find it's very easy to, to blame. Well, I, I think that I was the one who probably said that. Oh, and, no, it was hard to do. Well, but you know, when we had two grown men calling out to two very young girls. Call the police. You, you shout the police. Call the police immediately. That's nothing to do with short-term But there are people who wouldn't have been in our neighborhood otherwise. You know, that's kind of my point. <clears throat> people like that would have had no business on our street if they had not been invited through Airbnb. And so, yes, there are transients that are undesirable. Not everyone is. 90% the of the people... That are also not that's true. But, that's true. Sex offenders scattered in this community. You know what I'm saying. I mean, I'm just saying I mean, we, can't, we can't blame everything on transients or strangers. And I'm not. I'm just telling you my personal experience that wouldn't have otherwise happened on our little tiny Perry Street not had it not been for these strangers um, who, who were on uh, Some of them are lovely people. They have undesirable behaviors. Glass packs on cars, race, you know, eight cars lined up on the street, things like that. I understand. But they're nice people. But some are not such nice people. Well, yeah. it's stressing basically the capacity of a very, very switch street that I'm intimately familiar with. It's a very narrow, small residential street. Yes, it is. And it probably is, you know, there needs to be some common sense about how many people you put into a rental there. Yes, sir. I have a strict limit on the number of people out of my rental. The question is, is someone allowed to park on the street in front of my house? Not if it blocks the driveway, Jerry. In front of my house blocks your driveway across the Sometimes street. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it has, and we haven't been able to get out. Okay. Well, it, it has. I, I, I'm, I'm willing to tell people not to park in front of my house, but I'm just, my point being. Where are you going to park? 
there is room in the driveway. Sometimes, sometimes I come and park my car in front of my house, uh, run into the house to get something, and my sister-in-law did that, and she came out and complained about being parked right no, in no, front of the no, house. No, 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 it was not your sister-in-law. Okay. No. Okay. It is. No. Okay, I don't think we no. can solve this problem. I, it's, it's a personal thing between us. Rob, no, it's quite, not. Okay. <laughs> It's not personal. Well, I think you guys should I, try I to talk to each other more and try to work out some of the logistics of parking and some of the problems. I don't think that that can be manageable if you would communicate. Parking is very easy for us to work out. Parking is tough, it's a narrow street. I, no, I have enough room on the property. Well, oh, then tell your guests to park on your property. They do, they park on the lawn, so 26 cars, 8 cars, and right on the well, Who cares? It's his lawn. Well, they know. Yeah. It's his lawn. Okay. Yeah. These, are, these are just sort of individual, individual cases that we're talking about, and I think the issue comes back to... Yeah. to Let's have a discussion with the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's have a discussion. What we've heard and what we want to do. Let me keep going. Yes, please. Yes, okay. So I'd like to have a discussion, and I don't want to stay here all night. So let's discuss what have you heard, and what do you think we should do, if anything? I think I would like to spend five, I would like to spend five. Is it fair to make some manager or somebody available to go there's a meeting in session. Um, because that seemed to be the, the one thing that came out to me, apart from the... Please take the conversation out so we can have a conversation. Thank you, Terry. Because I agree with you, there's so much positive comment about the value to our community from short-term rentals. Yes. And I that is fine. great to hear. Yes. Now I just want to think about, you know, okay, so there's two bad situations. Can we do anything about those? Are they likely to be more than we can do? I don't know. I can't solve what's sitting here. I need to think about it. Well, the only thing that resonated with me, the commonality of these two situations, which it admittedly are some problematic, <coughs> is there's not an on-site yeah. person that is, and I heard, from what I heard, is an overwhelming support of this as a source of income, as an ability to use the property, as a hedge against all the costs. I mean, I was surprised how much we heard positive. Yep. And also the number of people that take the responsibility very seriously. They meet their guests. They go through the house with the guests and they leave. It's, it's almost... It's sort of like an experience I went to an Airbnb type rental in the city. That's exactly what the host did. He walked me through the house, told me this, told me the rules of the house, told me this, this is what the restaurants are, this is what this is. You know, it just seems to me that it, it's common. Do we need to have a regulation that says it? But then, do we need if we do that? then we're basically saying these are permitted uses. I mean, that's the other thing. Do we permit them as a, do we say these are permittable uses in residential zones, but there has to be a manager, a responsible person? I think person. the other thing that um, we didn't really get into tonight was the safety issue of egress and, and fire, you know, sprinklers or something of these large numbers of people in some of these houses. Well, there shouldn't be large numbers. I think that's the other point. But that happens, Michael. Yeah. Marty, doesn't John Coons rent out his house? The big one? The big house on White Hollow, right when you turn on to White Hollow, yeah. on the right side. Yeah. Okay, so that has, what, five bedrooms? A lot, the big house. And they rent it for a weekend with? Yeah. Jocelyn, thank you. Thank you, thank you Jocelyn. No. Oh. You can finish. I, can. I do. I just. My concern is always safety. Yes. And the safety includes traffic. And everyone that owns a piece of property in this town should know, no matter where your home is, 
you have to have enough room on the road so that emergency vehicles can get through. It's basic information. And it's, it's part of the safety thing, but it's not, it's not a problem. It's a problem with this gentleman, but I also happen to wonder how much of that is exaggerated. Um, I, I just, I don't know. Do we need a regulation? Do we need, Do we a, need regulation? a regulation for two properties? Is what it basically is. They seem to have gone off the skids. Well, I mean, is it going to be a growing situation in this town? Is this going to be a part of enterprise in the town? I think it already is. It is, and I think it's good from what I'm and, hearing. And what percentage of home ownership is involved in this? That. How many bed and breakfasts do we have? How many hotels and inns do we have? And how many Airbnb or short-term rentals do we have? Well, we got that answer tonight. It's not about that. It's about how many times they use. And a lot of these people that are registered might block it out for large periods of time for themselves or their families. Right. Right? So it's not about the number that are just registered. Correct. And that was another piece of good information. And I think that is really the critical comment is that there's two properties that are the bad apples. Yeah. In two properties are the bad apples and we hear also, I mean it was very, very interesting to hear the number of people that are doing this, but the number that are doing it very incidentally, which I wonder as Kayla gets her what's her name, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. I'm having a lot of so no. Michael, we have two Yeah, I mean, gets her talents into these and charges them twelve hundred a year. How many are going to drop off for financial reasons? Um, one other comment. Interestingly, in Perry Street, one person has come to this meeting to talk about it. No mm -hmm. other neighbors on the street. Well, that was his point. Uh, right. But the other neighbors who complained about the same. No, I don't think it matters how many. I think it's pretty well, clear it that you have a situation where you want to be assured that there's some kind of responsibility involved yes. in the rent, period. Well, I and agree, but it, all I'm I saying is that if that road, if all the neighbors were complaining, right. it would be a little bit more of a concern yes, to me than a neighbor that has a dispute with a neighbor versus the other. Does seem, yeah, it watching the interactions, it seems very personal. The thing is that no, the have mufflers. They're just the mufflers that were on Bugatti's from oh, you. however yeah. vintage they are. I don't want to get into that. But I mean, that, 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 that was a big complaint. Well, yeah, but I mean, some of you know. I'm some really of trying to make a point here, a global point. We're talking about responsibility. We're yeah. talking about if you're going to rent out any part of your house, you have to be responsible <coughs> about it. Yeah. How do we ensure that responsibility? I don't think you can. You can, can we? Can I enforce it? Special permit with conditions. For everyone, individual, special permits with conditions. Come before us, notify the neighbors. We'll hear from the other neighbors if they want to say something. I'm just throwing that out there. It's well, I know of, that's one. It's a tremendous amount of it's huge just amount a of bureaucratic work. nightmare. Right. And did you have the point that was brought up tonight about grandfathering? Okay, but so if we, if we, if we end up having to grandfather all of the issues that we're trying to regulate, yeah. what have you achieved? Correct. I, the other good thing I thought that came out of the meeting, I thought wouldn't come out of the meeting, was the commercial places that were renting rooms and that they would be impacted by the short-term rentals, and they're not. No, no they're, they're, they're they are. They're they are. Yeah. What was it that said basically they're not, they're not enough hotel rooms? Right. We need this. Right. And Kevin was scared in like it said that to me separately, yeah. even before this issue came up. I was up. surprised by that. Yeah. Well, they said that right. he was able to, to have a 150-person uh, bank 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 because in the, excess of what their capacity was. Right. For that reason. How the Deborah's right. Hold on. It's about responsibility. Can you legislate responsibility in a regulation? I'm not sure you can. Danella wants to say something, and I think Terry wanted to say something. Or the sole member of the public, two members that have stayed through this. Go ahead, Dana. Well, I just want to mention something about sampling. About I, what? Sampling. sampling. I don't, I would not 
say that the people who are present tonight represent everybody that has a point of view about short-term rentals. It's a limited audience who heard about the workshop and they came. And we're talking about a growing situation and we're talking about being proactive. As far as complainers go, I know in Amesville, uh, because I met, I'm president of the Amesville Association, I've gotten people who will complain to me about what's going on with a neighbor, but they're reluctant to go to the neighbor, they're reluctant to go to Curtis, they're reluctant to go to the they police, be going to us. and they're reluctant to go to anyone. So sometimes complainers will keep it to themselves. So I agree that um, we saw a very, I did see a balanced perspective, uh, and I in no way advocate what Simsbury did, which is to ban short-term rentals. It's appreciated in this town. Homeowners, many homeowners need it. But I wouldn't say that we have only two serious complaints in this town because two people came and complained. It could be... That's it, anecdotal, Lila. It could be a lot more, and we just don't know about it. You should probably have a town meeting about it. I mean... When we have town meetings and have hundreds of people, yeah. then this you have to town meeting. This the was the meeting. meeting well, last week, and there were what 22 people at the yeah. town meeting. This is we got a great turnout here. This is the topic, and I'm not. The that the you're right, though. Uh, that we the because the because it's a town we issue. It's got to be brought up in yeah. front of the town, but you have to. Uh, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you corral all the town into one place? We tried this we evening. Done that in a school. Yeah. It's fun. Well, if they do an ordinance, that would, that would go but, that direction. But the town doesn't want to do an ordinance. I spoke to Curtis directly about it, and his first response was, I don't want to get calls at 2 in the morning. And I don't think we ought to sit here, we're all tired, at least I'm tired, and maybe I'm projecting and you're all having a second win. But, you know, to look for reasons not to do something because it's burdensome, I think we need to look at the issue, both sides of the issue, what can we reasonably do to manage the growth? And it is going to grow, there's no question about it. One thing that didn't come up with the realtors, Kathy's been pointing it out to me, is just look at the real estate advertisements. Many of the advertisements, Harney, for example, will say, perfect Airbnb. When it's trying to sell it. Well, well, but, I guess the, but I guess the so what? I mean, it's going to grow. It's going to be the, pro the the thing that I'm leading to. I mean, to. that now that people can't sell the houses, the houses are sitting on the market. I'm not saying they shouldn't become Airbnbs. I'm just saying yeah, that it if, that it will grow, so. and if we manage it sensibly, I heard people who have Airbnbs they weren't opposed to managing them in some manner. Well, I think some of the people who are here were very clear that the way. They manage, and this gets back to what Pepper said, it's about behavior. Yes. You have very responsible people, you've heard from almost everyone who is involved, goes, meets their guests, is available, and then you hear about the two that aren't working, and yeah, okay, you can go take, you can extrapolate out. We had 20 people where it's working, we had two complainers, you can extrapolate that out, and but, but the, 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 the statistics are the same. You have more people who I believe are liking it than not, but the people who are liking it are behaving in a responsible manner, the way almost akin to being a B and B. So the question is, can we do something about the ones that are not don't have a manager? Who can Mrs. Whalen call at two in the morning? To complain, not me, not Nancy. Okay, but I think also, in terms of the internal situation, how many people can stay in a house with two bedrooms and one bathroom? I mean, this is not for something that a neighbor would complain about. This is something that puts a strain on uh, maybe trash, parking, right, but sewers. What's that? We haven't heard that being a problem. Because they don't. We have. We guess we did. I I I I Cars and things. Yeah. Cars and things. Well, you can apply the same wow. standards to a B and B. You could crib from the B and B language, right? But 
and, and, and that could become your standard, and right. I don't know who's going to enforce it. I'll, I'll give you another example with my own personal situation in terms of the number of people renting. Because we rented to a, a couple, and he was a graduate of Salisbury School. He came for uh, alumni weekend. We had parking for two cars. They had two cars. I come home that night and there's 22 cars or 23 cars in the driveway <laughs> because they had parties with all the alumni. My point is, all that could be regulated and permitted and you're going to have those kinds of situations. And you're going to have, and we, I did have, <laughs> How many beer bottles lots of beer bottles. Uh, lots of garbage. You know, the regulation's not going to prevent that. Right. That's, correct. That's all I'm saying. You know, That's I mean, back to the owner should... being there. Um, well, I was there. <coughs> well, what did you do? It's not going to happen again, is it? Well, I don't know. That's my point. I, hope I, I don't know that somebody else party. is going to come and have a party. And if they do, why did should you I tell them no parties? No. Where do you go? But you should, you should, even if I did, permissive. I'm not sure that if they do it, it's done. And you can't do anything. Don't you if, we can't, if we can't enforce our regulations with a fine, I'm not sure it's worth the effort to go through to create a regulation. Because we're going, to, we're going to say, please don't do that anymore. And, and they're going to continue to do it. And there's, right. no, there's no consequence. Robin was talking about that as a financial consequence. Well, I think it's my When you can keep their deposit, you had to clean up at the beer bottles and all, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. I think it's time, Robin, we should talk about the need for an ordinance in this town. Forget the short term for fines. For fining people when they break our regulations. That is a, a, do we have can we do that? Do the no, that's, no. do that? well, that's, that's a it's bigger that's a bigger thing. That's a huge that's a huge ball of wax. But We're not going to unpackage tonight. Not tonight. What if we just <laughs> boil down some of the key points, you know, that yeah. that the occupants uh, the occupancy of the building, that there has to be off street parking that there has to be, do not exceed the, the number of beds, that sort of thing, bathrooms. And and if they do not comply, issue a cease and desist. But how are you going to know if you have Because if you get a complaint, if you get a complaint that there's seven cars in the driveway, mm -hmm. that's, they're gone. that's, yeah, but they're gone. If they've got a People picture, photograph them. you know, you gotta have, there's gotta be some sort of evidence. Can I, can I ask for a blocked question? Can I ask everyone a really blunt question? We have got affordable housing regulations to write. We have an ongoing lawsuit that we are dealing with Limar Park. I mean, how much energy do we want to devote to this and how do we want to devote it? Because on all the things that we have to do, where does this fall as a priority? To me, the only thing I see we can do maybe is insist for a manager, a responsible person. I don't see how we can possibly monitor the bedrooms, the cars, and that, and that. You know, I don't think people want to defy the regulations. I mean, you talk about, well, how do you enforce? I think people in this town, a lot of the Airbnb people here, would respect a regulation. I agree. And so I don't think we should be saying, well, we shouldn't do it because how are we going to enforce it? That's what I'm saying. If we add a just a cursory few sentences to our Airbnb regulation, we will we'll have it. Well, we do. The 210. No, no, no. That's bad that's breakfast. Right. That's bad breakfast. I just add it to that section. But then it becomes There's a special a permit. Do you want it by special oh, permit? Okay, all right. All right. Do we want to create a special yeah. permit? Then maybe I like where permit. you're going, Alan, actually, because I, I think that it's a suggestion. I think, let, let's think about that because I, I agree with Michael. We, we mustn't get in the way of our own energy with the housing. We've got now the money and a consultant and that is the priority for this time. What I heard tonight, bad luck. We've got two lousy situations, bad luck. Right? We'll get to it. Right? I don't until we have more complaints, I don't think it is a major priority, but I think we can fix it. I, I don't think we need to address it quite yet because I don't think we actually have enough information, never mind enough complaints. I also think that other towns have not, they're, they're considering doing Winchester and wherever else it was. Cornwall. 
Cornwall are considering doing an ordinance and others are considering a regulation. Um, so maybe that's what we're doing right now. I don't know that we need to address this at this time. But I do think we've got a lot of information now. I, I disagree with you on that point of line. I agree with you that we don't need to necessarily do something But we right do now. have more information. We do have a lot of information. Now. I was surprised by the information we received, to be honest with you. I was surprised how much positive information we received. Mm. And I would thought there would be more people upset about it. And apparently, that's interesting. I mean, Let's see what happens if the Lakeville Journal actually writes this out, whether we hear more in our office, because I don't know if all the commissioners realise that the Lakeville Journal didn't actually put anything in the paper um, about this, so it is possible that we haven't had a very broad response tonight. This could get into the Lakeville Journal, because I, I, if you want me to do, I can send it to Leela Hawken, who's a reporter. And she Patrick Sullivan was here at the back, so yes. okay. they, they, they have said they will cover this. So let's see if we get some more reaction from people in town. In the meantime, let's just think about, you know, find out what these other towns end up doing. Mm -hmm. Let's think about how to do it. But if you let me, I'll put it on, I, put, I have a YouTube page, and I'll put it on that, and that way I give it to Ruth Epstein, I send it to her, I send it, do you guys have a website? There's so, uh, they have a, I, mm -hmm. The town like, has a website. Right. I can put it on your, your website sure. and get the word out. That's the most important thing. Thank All right. you. Well, we'll see. Maybe if we have to get more information, but I think tonight what I heard was overwhelmingly positive and two problematic properties, and the commonality of those was absentee management. Absolutely. And that to me is to take home for now. Maybe we'll have another forum and we'll get more people. And as far as the people that don't want to come out, I am really sorry, but, you know, we have a forum, we have people have the chance to be heard. I mean, I do not want us to become like Fairfield County, where everybody runs the town with every problem and no one talks to neighbors. That's not a desirable situation. I'm sorry, my friend. Terry, Terry, do you have something you want to add? I'm learning more by listening and talking. I was one of the people who rented from John Holmes, that big, beautiful mansion. That's how I came to Lime Rock in the first place. And I rented it with my Long Island Triumph Car Club people, and we did have 20 people in the house. Of course, we're but all, it's a big, we're it's all grown-ups. But like Michael says, he had a caretaker there. Yes. She came, she touched bases, yes. she interviewed herself. She, she was there late in the evening. She got there early in the morning. We knew somebody was watching over us, which made us feel safe, too. But somebody was there in attendance, and I think that's very important. That's the and, common and denominator that Michael says is having somebody okay. present and on board. And the question is, can we create? I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to put these things through a special permit process. Mm -hmm. These are cottage industries. Exactly. Many of these people are not making much money at all. I've heard at least of a couple now that have folded when they got the tax bills from Kayla because they weren't getting even enough to make the $1,200 mm -hmm. tax. I don't want to create more burdens, but I don't want to see unsupervised situations like Carr and Mrs. Whalen described. So what I'd like to know is, can we put in our regulations but if we do that, we have to sort of accept the fact that these are permitted, that these are accepted uses. Ex are these incidental and accessory to a home use? Sounds to me like they are. Yeah, I would say so. That's the first regulatory mm -hmm. thought. If they're accessory and incidental to a home use, right, but that isn't that. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Isn't that the fundamental issue, though, with the ones that aren't working? Because they're not fundamentally accessory. They are the whole yeah. use of that. Oh, yeah. yes. You I mean, you have, 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 have a guy, it's one thing that's, that's accessory. Very, very, very good, very good point. So There you go. There's where yeah, I think, yeah. Oh, that's where the solution That's good. I do have to excuse myself. Sorry. That's a yeah. really good job. That's really? exactly is that they're being exclusively used as opposed to an accessory use incidental. Mm -hmm. And that's a distinguishing point. Well, the other thing is, 
Yeah. You think about it. Anything. Any, you get to any be vice use? chair at least for another year, <laughs> maybe chair. Um, you know, if it's not in the regulation, it's not permitted. Correct. Here are these uses that are not in the regulation that are taking place. Correct. So technically, they're in violation of the existing zoning regulation. Yes. And that's a question maybe for Chuck, because I know it came up at CAG of, you know, where the regulations can cross over to homeowners' personal use of their property, yeah. and when it crosses over to being regulated and what triggers that. I, I don't know the answer. No, I mean, but that worries me tremendously. Maybe that solves a problem about free existing non conforming because the use isn't allowed now. Well, that's a very, very interesting distinction you made. If we call renting out rooms occasionally and you're largely involved with it, and it is accessory, and we could deem it to be accessory and incidental to home ownership, if you have structures that are really exclusively being used, such as the two that were described, that is a commercial use, and that is, should be maybe prohibited. Or a special permit. Or a special permit. Yeah, there is a real, that's, there's a real. Good job. Yeah, because it's really, that's interesting. There's a real division there. But I mean, if we're going to do that, we have to amend, if that's the way we want to do, we have to be very explicit that we consider short-term rentals right. owner with owner involvement or occupancy or whatever to be customary and incidental to home ownership and a permitted incidental use, whereas getting a whole house and turning it into what Carr and Mrs. Whalen described is clearly not. And, and I understand what everyone said tonight. I, my own personal concern is I don't know that we should be writing regulation for a problem that doesn't exist. Exactly. And maybe it will become a problem in the future and I'll regret that statement. But if we just went to town ordinance, you'd have, it, it would be denied immediately Maybe. because it would be, but just what happened here, I, I think, I think it just my own personal view, that, you know, we're trying to satisfy something that's not a problem. And I understand you're about being ahead of the curve, but I'm not sure we can be ahead of the curve well, with regulations. You actually if, might have. If it's already happened successfully, pretty much out of What's the sampling? Two out of twenty. Two out of but John, you actually might have really hit upon the way what we should do is if we are of the mind to determine that short-term rentals are accessory incidental to home ownership in houses that are occupied or managed by the homeowner we would then legitimize something that is technically not Accessible. legal now and then outside of that would fall very clearly the problem ones would be outside of that. So in a way we would say that this is something acceptable. We're sort of backing into it backward. We're saying this is it. We're going to make this accessory and incidental to home ownership with certain caveats. And if it's not, then it clearly is, is a problem. And if it's not, then it's not permitted. Yes, it's not permitted. And then technically... Yeah, but how can you, how can you do that? Uh, because you can rent long-term rental, but you can't rent short-term rental to somebody who buys the property for the sole purpose of renting it? How can you restrict that? That's interesting. If you buy a property solely for short-term rental, which is well, it's understanding has been happening. Is it commercial at that point? I would think it becomes commercial activity in a residential zone. In a zone. residential zone. But that's then they have to come for a special That's that gray area I was talking about. We've got to talk to Chuck home about ownership and, and, and what your rights are for owning the property. Do you have to live on every piece of property that you own? Obviously you can't. 
but somebody could have five rental properties and it's okay to rent them more than a month, but not less than a month. Yeah, yeah I mean, look, 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 look at the Coons. Look at plenty the Coons uh, yeah, fellows. John, John does that. Now. Yeah, He's but they do long-term rentals. Long-term rentals. Long -term rentals. You have people they own half of that part of Lime Rock, the red roof section. We call it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the red roof section. I, I think that actually there, there are two distinct problems here. I think one of it is that there's activities going on in, in homes that are technically not legal. And maybe using the same rationale we use in Limar Park, we should look at some of those activities to see if they're acceptable in today's day and age in a residential zone, much the way we tried to sort out Lime Rock, what they were doing and what wasn't. But these ones clearly fall outside. So they're really two different problems. So and I, for one, would love to see us look at the accessory use and sort of be very clear of what type of short-term rental we would consider accessory incidental accessory to a residential home. Can we mull this and maybe have a short discussion at our next meeting? Well, we've got a very full agenda for our next meeting. Okay. Next Monday. I'll be absent. I'll be absent. And I'll be mm -hmm. And John's going to be absent. Mm -hmm. He'll be and absent. Deborah's you're absent. Here, Marty. Marty's it. Marty, you got a chair next Monday's meeting. I already told him. He didn't flinch. I can't get the thing to come out. No. No, it's the solar field in your mountains. Oh, okay. I'm going to send you some ideas, some few suggestions. And an accessory. Well, it doesn't sound to me right now that you've got any. We seem to be of a consensus that this is a problem we don't have to. No, but John actually. Our way to answer. Yeah, no, no, but no, John he, actually brought up this sort of, it's almost like. The counter to the problem exactly. is that exactly. we have a lot of things that are not technically, we should address this issue because it doesn't really fit into the zoning. You either close everybody down, which I don't think is the wish, or you find a way to narrowly define what it is. So that's about it. That's my <laughs> point. I mean, we don't have to act on this. Immediately, yeah, I agree, Alan. This is very, this was really informative. Are you going to talk to Chuck about this? Probably not this week. Accessory and incidental. No, no, I'm not going to be out of commission for the rest of the week, so. Uh, I will talk to Chuck about some of it. I don't want to generate a huge legal memo. I think we need to talk more, we need to talk more about, among ourselves about this. Who's going to be at the November meeting? Are you all going to be here? The October meeting. No. The October meeting's next week. Next week. We're talking November. Who's going to be here? I can be there. I'll be here. Why do we put it on for discussion? Donato, you're going to be able to, you're going to be here? I will be here. November meeting. Okay. Okay. Is that it? I can shut it off? Yeah. All right. Okay, that's it. Let's open. Oh, now we can say what we really think. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs>